Hello everyone, today we talk about the late Roman Empire and more specifically those broader cultural traits rather especially to the single sources that we will be um, explaining in, in, in synthesis but still, you know, uh, as a comprehensive uh, list of interesting works and authors to, to, to check out, definitely. Uh, as we have discussed, I think, late um, antiquity on multiple occasions, but it's always good to fix also certain you know, uh, points of reference. I would say that can be useful. Some of you ask me, you know, what what sources, what authors, what should I read? Right? I I'm not a, a huge fan of of putting out this information because I prefer to to express my own criticism about the whole thing. But I understand that these mm, you know broader pictures, right, of 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 such a an era that that is objectively very complex, right? Can be useful, um, and that's the reason why I'm doing this. And we have addressed. I, I don't think I have created something like a late antiquity playlist or something like that. There is a lot of, about it in the, the Roman history playlist, in the migration era playlist. So, if for more details, I address you to. to to those. Today we'll be talking, for example, about certain authors that I covered also in uh, the um, Severian Age literature video that discusses about certain authors uh, of Latin literature of the time. I don't remember just Latin, but you know. Um, so we are talking about an age that is even difficult, as you understand, to, to properly scan temporally speaking, what do you want the late antiquity, what, what is to begin and what is this. Now we don't have any time now to, to explain the thing at length, we will do it on another video, but um, let's say we can start just for the sake of practicality here with the period inaugurated by the year 235, right, that uh, brings to, you know, um, you know, to, to the beginning of the so-called third century crisis that lasts for not even another 50 years. Uh, objectively, it's not like the third century. We often we say the, the third century crisis, right? But it's actually narrower in this sense, even more interesting. We, we Today we distinguish also a lot in what, you know, crisis means. Obviously, not just in a deterministic sense and um, especially not in a deterministic sense, but also observing the mostly the continuity that obviously in in this major aspects of civilizations it, it is always what uh, is more is more evident uh, in absolute term we could say um, so up to a few generations ago the third century and um, this and, and all that began with that ideally in the historiographical vision uh, it's, n it's not fundamentally believed anymore Right, the, the improvements in research have radically modified the idea that the historians usually had about it before. Of course, it uh, it's a period that corresponds uh, to the you know I would say the the three well-defined steps of you know the historiographical tradition. But there is uh, probably an innovation in the way we see late antiquity that must be researched, not much in fact in the chronological breaks, right, but in the characteristics of each one of these phases. That is also a method that actually has been in turn surpassed by saying, you know, why should we scan this thing like that? And uh, of course there is an important, if you, you know, if it was never been introduced to Roman history, this can be very important, very useful also in many ways. But at the same time it, it's already putting the person's mind on, on a track that says, look, you know, this is kind of different from the rest, so you should be able to understand the differences. It's perfectly fine. Uh, together with that, um, you must always stress that, especially in these times and pre-industrial societies, uh, generally speaking the differences were very low throughout all the, the, the wall transformation and also with r relatively you know, low, at least compared to our own standards of diversity, let's say, than um, even other cultures. This is um, particularly important for a number of reasons that are particularly evident in the late antiquity that especially brought the empire to deal with other realities that before practically didn't even exist, at least in, in the uh, 
um, you know, in the aggressive side of it, right, in the in the mindset, in the mentality, right, in the mi migration era playlist, we, we try to, to speak uh, often of both sides, right, you know, uh, that is com a complicated thing to do, I mean, I, I shouldn't even be using the term side in here, but properly, you know, you know, with all these peoples about which we, we don't even have any source that is not Roman, properly speaking, because they simply didn't write and didn't, you know, have that, that certain same type of you know mindset and politics and society um, that would allow them to do uh, functionally and purposely m more than else. Um, so I think it's important to stress in here that there is um, a great platform, a great a uh, great plateau that is shared by most of these cultures that uh, found many meeting grounds. Right as the the plateau is is thicker and harder. Uh, you know, what can move over it is, is relatively simpler, right? It just floats above it. And this is even thinking about Mithraism spreading in the Roman Empire, the same Christianity that we will see today. But um, coming back to, to the years of the, the, the alleged crisis, right? That, that was such, right? It was important and it was definitely something that changed the empire uh, deeply at many levels, but it, it was a crisis that brought to a recomposition and this is something that um, is not just very evident from, if anything, just the evenimental side of the story, right? You can't objectively deny that uh, the Constantinian Empire was a freaking amazing thing, right? That it was stable, prosper, strong, it was an incredible success in many ways, then eventually what we start calling even we made a video some time ago about w what is Byzantine and wh how, why should we, using these term, very controversial topic, especially the last video I made about it uh, was about properly on the term Byzantine and I, and I put a lot of stuff in there that uh, I wanted it to, do, to be expressly provocative, especially regarding what the such meanings and and their opposites ha are turning out in today's culture that is to say you know now we we em you know we embrace uh, an extreme view in the past now we have as a consequence embraced the the, the uh, its opposite from the other extremes um, and that that's not a very healthy way of dealing with history because it's merely ideological it's merely saying you know uh, we have to uh, avenge some perspective. It's important to be contrarian in the way we explain things, but for for the sake of, especially when we meet with a prejudice and say, look, that you know, th this thing is the other way around, right? And however, in that sense, most of what we understand about the historical reality lays in the middle, and. Um, that's why I, I believe, after all, that there is also a certain narrative that is being introduced about late antiquity that uh, is recognized as such an enormous thing, right, as the, the triumph of our new universalistic order and of its, you know, the values, the, the, its own assertion, right? It, it's like, you know, being impressed by it, but still, you know, um, doing it because either we are maybe specialists on the field, I'm personally not. But, uh, and probably this also helps me partially to, to have, a, you know, I can say an unbiased uh, perception of the thing, because of course, uh, where a specialist in this period knows way more than, than I can um, in this regard. But th there is also the impression that there is a sort of niche that is being created saying, ah, this thing was so great that we don't even ha need to, to put it, it in chronological perspective or to accept it was. Uh, a crisis or a decline at some point, as there were actually revivals and improvements throughout the, the world thing. And um, there is still, even in those people that try to push, you know, the, this this agenda, still the relics actually of that, you know, backward his historiographical perception that still, you know, uh, evidence the highlight, especially in this contrast, the, the money can attitude to history and say, you know, we have to tell this history because we have to, to avenge some, you know, uh, erroneous uh, perspective for a moralistic uh, political point of view. It it, it happens, right? But it, it's something that I personally am not particularly fond of, and that's why I try to to keep it fairly uh, fairly balanced, right? At least for, for my, what my understanding of the thing really was.
All right. The years 235 to 284 are considered like a bit like the last part of the early empire or the beginning of the late, uh, right? And they were signed, marked uh, indeed by many and um, serious crises that struck at all levels of public life, uh, politics, the army, uh, socio-economical matters, the collective mentalities, right? There is all a kind of a psychologistic uh, explanation of whatever that the masses began to think of those. And it's probably spot on at many levels, also anthropologically speaking, or in the history of religions. But even in there, what those people actually thought is, is very difficult to, to, to grasp, right? As the empire was simply the entire world. So the the differences, the diversities that existed and coexisted very often in here c could be very, very different, right? Think just about, you know, the, the issue of the uh, Christian or pagan persecutions, right? That was quite evidently happening in the very same places, at least in, in those that were, that the thing is better documented, because, for example, whatever happened in the countryside is actually a, a, a great mystery for most of, in fact, of history in general. Um, but um, today, at least historiographically speaking, we tend to insist on the limits of such crises. And this is actually good, as we were saying before, um, that we're objectively more or less uh, deep according to the regions and times. Right. For example, in this period, I don't know, Africa and the Iberian Peninsula uh, suffered uh, less than the Gauls, for example. Furthermore, there are well witnessed reactions that the that the, the majority of the the scholars attributes uh, the Illyrian emperors that are seen as these strong figures that objectively kept or brought together broke back the the, the, the empire in one piece at the end of the third century and that's also an extremely fascinating chapter and I, I partially uh, agree always uh, you know, and actually strongly agree because some of I think of the finest emperors of the time lived um, in in this in this m very moment. But um, the, there, there is also the the point that, especially towards the, the late Roman Empire, it's not that before we know an astonishing lot about it. But generally speaking, we have freaking no idea of whatever you know what is that really broke the thing back together. Right, you you can't say okay if it hadn't been for this guy, uh, that the empire would have not made it. I, it's possible, actually. Th this this is not even strange in historical perspective. But the point is, you know, what about all the rest? Right, what the hell do we know about what Constantine really thought? Right, you know, the, the there is a, an overload of um, publications, for example, that are written in these topics, on sources that are at this point. Um, you know, un uncompromisingly biased and instru um, you know, and instrumental and functionalized. All, all sources are biased, but at this point, we start properly losing track of in what, what was the average critical, you know, free, uh, free critical uh, judgment on these issues. Right? The story is called, you know, historians wrote things because they had either to support one side or the other, and to present these figures in a way or another. What do we know about con the Constantinian reforms? Of the army and uh, the money, the, the, and, you know, yeah, the currency that we mostly attribute to Constantine, while saying Diocletian mostly made the administrative and tax part of the story. We actually have no proof of this, right? We have no proof that you know one did the thing and one did the other. We mostly attribute it like that, for the sake of, for didactical sake, um, in general. But what do we know about their ministers, about their administrators? Um, how things came to happen. It is not that these people were probably not understanding that or they were not responsible for it. Of course, I presume that Diocletian and Constantine were as as great as competent as they were, objectively. But uh, still, we don't have the the evidence, the direct, you know, the proof of it in a way or another, right? We can evaluate them as as you know more as generals very often because at least military history tends to. To, to help us with military logic in, in a way that, you know, politics and societies, you know, really render way more difficult sometimes, at least on certain aspects, but they're all intertwined, and even in there we have to understand whether it's the resilience of a system or the genius of an individual that, that really made the thing happen.
right? And this is very complicated and there is really no answer, no definitive answer for that. Everybody wants to, to see one thing in this thing, and I do too, right? I believe, especially the order inaugurated with Constantine was, you know, it didn't kick in immediately. It was a very gradual thing that took, uh, you know, the roots in, in Constantine's uh, government, but eventually developed further, you know, even for throughout a, a whole century. Uh, if not more, it depends really what you want to to highlight them in their in historical perspective and um and um i I'm fine with the perspective, but I also realize that yeah I mean it's a way of of reading the thing and maybe in, in a teleological sense so it's it's really very complicated and especially I stress this in a world was enormous like the the Roman one uh, at the time so beginning with two hundred eighty four began what what was before called the, the, the low empire. I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but low late empire, where it was um, a definition that you, you still find sometimes in history books. And this expression had mm, obviously taken on a kind of a deteriorate sense, right? It w had become synonymous of, of um, a deep and general decadence and or decline. Right, it was stressed also for in a in a moralistic sense. Right, we have no evidence of this by by any stretch of the imagination, but it's um, it's still something somewhat rooted in, in the broader per popular perception of the thing. Right, you know, people can be clever about you know the complexity, you know the the the, the package of um, you know factors that they read here and there. Uh, about how and why the empire failed, but actually the the resilience of this sense that you know the Romans were not the ones that they were at the beginning anymore. Hence the empire crumbled, right? For whatever reason, right? That these people got you know the the myth of the good savage that you know that this the, the the Romans had become rich and soft, and you know the the barbarians arrived and took over, which is not even technically true um, in 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 practice, uh, nor from you know, the, not even if you look at the thing in, 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 in its transition, right, when actually the Germans came to rule over certain areas, you know, the still that they basically got Romanized in a very few generations, um, in most of the cases, and especially the most developed areas of the empire, uh, they um, still there is this idea even of Christianity as having been this terrible thing. There are people who are really phobic about the fact, considering that, the empire somewhat was denied in its essence because it had become Christian, right? I can understand the, the, the big, you know, the, the massive difference that you want to, to, to you know, to stress that is historically correct, right? But um, to to even dare to think it was like something that happened, for example, from one day to another, it happened for a, ne for a negative reason or without no purpose. And, uh, you know, how to explain the success in here just through imposition and violence, with which means, right, with the ones of the Christian church, it, it, it's, uh, you say, well, the one of the, the state that, yeah, but how did the state decide to become Christian? Have you ever wondered that and, and why did the thing was done? Today we will not discuss this either. We will not even hide the fact, uh, why would I? Because I, you know, probably I, I sound, you know, fellow Christian in this sense, but, you know, the Christians easily uh, killed, massacred, uh, destroyed, um, oppressed. Uh, there is no doubt that what in the pagan world was lacked as a freedom of conscience for which you were imposed to uh, sacrifice to the deity, uh, you know, pain getting killed, right, was substituted with Christian, um, with monotheistic intolerance, which is, it is de defined at the time, juridically speaking, you know, it started being true, you couldn't, you couldn't profess certain um, religions, you the, the thing was dramatically, even in there, softer and gradual than we think. It's not that a, from a certain point onwards, or even before during the, the persecutions against the Christians, the whole system began to exterminate people randomly in in, in mass, you know, with blood baths. You know, it, it didn't happen like that. Uh, These things actually superimposed to dramatically tense uh, political struggles of every kind, mostly about, of course, of power to connect to the cities mostly. And uh, this is often, you know, explained, uh, no, because it was paganism versus Christianity. No, it wasn't like that, right? That's a monofactual explanation of history that nobody takes even remotely seriously, um, academically speaking. Uh, also because it's been 
you know, th there was technically not even the need to, the, you know, to, to debunk it, right? It, it was just evidently not true um, by any historical standard. And that is not to deny the, the value of religion and uh, and of beliefs, whichever it was, pagan, uh, theistic. It, it's, uh, it's it's not the point. The point is that people do that all the time. Even if you take away religion, th those people would have done the same uh, for some other reason. And um, there are lay uh, religions that cause as, as much, if not more, that than, than that. So actually, this. This hysterical way of looking at history in religious standards, I think it's an obsession that we somewhat formulated. I remember ever since I was a kid, you know, people started, you know, it started all as a reaction to uh, to multiculturalism that objectively, even in, in, you know, it's something that, everything that ends in ism, I don't like, actually. I believe that communitarism and its op opposite multiculturalism are actually by themselves pretty stupid ideas. Um, and um, th there are more sophisticated versions of them, and the truth is that they, they meet in the middle ground where they, they nullify each other, so that's why I believe they're stupid in the first place. But I remember this obsession of the clash of cultures and civilizations, the East and the West, right, this idea that um, you know, the, the people's I, opinions are very shaded in this as well. I must say, you know, there are people who embrace Christianity as the, the new Western stuff. There are others say, oh, no, this was just a Semitic religion. It didn't belong to, to our Europe that wasn't even considered at the time uh, in those terms. Um, and uh, it, we can't applicate these categories, these patterns of interpretation to a time that had, as far as we know, very different ones in that regard. The Christian one began at the point, but it was also very different from whatever was the uh, the original message and wherever it had come from, because you know that, you know, the, the, the Christian experience isn't began, philologically speaking, philosophically, literally, just, you know, with, with Christ, but it's a result of a very particular side of Hellenistic Judaism and all the various influences that came from there and even in, after that you know we made a lot of videos about the spread of Christianity within the Roman Empire we have observed of how you know Christianity had to cope with completely different and new problems and to solve them and this of late antiquity is actually a period of enormous work of civilization we mostly conceive it as you know one civilization that killed each other actually what happened between paganism Christianity is that most of the time they were coexisting um, and most of the times I'm talking for 12 for, for centuries and centuries that even exceed the, the late antiquity right both at the beginning and at the end of it it was a largely non-violent confrontation uh, and that actually boosted tremendously both pagan and Christian um, you know Mm, uh, I, I don't know what term to use, but you know the, their, their own capabilities of uh, implementing themselves, you know, and, and enriching themselves and strengthening themselves, and also paganism is not a a religion as we mean it, right? There is at least not one, and it was a very complex system. It's more a system of reference than anything. Um, to call it a religion is to to you know reduce paganism to to a to a theistic category that at the time didn't exist right so paganism is something very complex very beautiful and uh, and christianity drew a lot from it obviously because civilization was pagan at the time and christianity also brought its own um uh, judean element in there and properly christian in the sense that however was built especially with saint paul in the uh, in the roman empire and for the roman empire Right, there would have not been a Christianity without, without Saint Paul. Right, uh, even if, uh, Jesus was not sufficient historically speaking. If we have to, uh, you know, not see it in, in any other term. Right, you know, Christianity is properly, properly makes it with Saint Paul. And it's um, even in here, people say, "Oh no, well you're forgetting about Julian and the restoration of paganism." Once again. That's a red specifically that derives from the idea that th there was um, a, an essential op opposition to the two things, right? It means not to know even Christian or pagan literature of the time, and what how and how the two systems looked and considered each other, right? Um, it it's it's very complex actually, and once again we can't explain it now here, but we will do it. Uh, uh, over, uh, in order. If you're interested, I, I recently made a video on the 
uh, the, the Christian community of Rome and the Marsonian uh, Gnosticism, which um, explains a bit of that, right? There is a, a Christianity there that is capable of, you know, stemming actually very dangerous um, influences that were not functional properly even to the coexistence of the various systems there. But uh, we will keep making videos about this stuff, the history of religion and philosophy of literature because it's very important and it debunks a lot of misconceptions that are very widespread. Um, so, um, scholars today insist rather on the, the, the concept of rebirth in a way or another that has um, invested during late antiquity such a large number of sectors and it, it's it's often perceived as a new order to be uh, either uh, inaugurated or better restored as the Romans properly actually believed given that the empire was not just you know one random stuff you know to be substituted by one another it was a a solely religious stuff. Uh, I, I become boring to stress this over and over again, but you know, I think that the single most important thing to stress when talking about the Roman Empire or any other pre-French Revolution system, uh, and specifically in this case, doesn't matter if we're talking about paganism or Christianity, the only reason why an empire could possibly exist by definition was religious and military at the same time. Right, there was no other possible, m imaginable foundation to anything political and social, but religiously and militarily speak. Right, and that's also why we made that video on uh, Ambrose of Milan that we will discuss partly also today, relatively to the creation not just of a Ro Roman Christian moral conscience, but properly to the you know support also of the uh, of the authority uh, in in the use of violence in for the defense of the same Christianity. This was one of those works of civilizations that I was talking to you about before, that, you know, obviously Christianity is, you know, a, a Christian that thing, you know, that there is no thing like, a possible thing like a, a pacifist Christian, right? It, it's, it's, I think it's utterly disgusting after, you know, all the O's and of inks that have been written historiographically speaking in Western civilization to be just a Westerner and uh, speak of one of such as in nine uh, statements like that Christianity is a pacifistic ideology. It's never been by definition. Christianity is just pacific. It's not pacifistic. Learn the difference of the words. Right? This is very important. Um, and yet, it's not that is to say this new turn didn't take, uh, you know, didn't cause ideological problems you know, and perplexities to to the Christian community, in this sense, is to be regarded as a universal community, not as a, as a sect, but uh, eventually with the Christianization of the same empire, properly the entire world, the ecumenic empire, the universal empire, right? Uh, here it has no matter at all whether you say it was not ecumenic because it <laughs> didn't cover the globe. Uh, the Roman Empire was the, the only possible world at the time. That's what a Roman thought like. Right, and that's how a Christian thought like, because that was a unique thing, right? Even if you lived outside, as a Christian, as many Christians actually lived, even outside the Roman Empire, in the Persian Empire, started going up to China, whatever, um, the only possible reality we can live is, of, of course, of a, a, a universal empire. There is no other alternative, right? Simply because the world is religious and military, solely, by definition. Uh, also, um, some scholars prefer to speak of, um, in fact, late antiquity rather than other definitions, right, of the lower Roman Empire or the at the end of the Roman Empire, of course, that it, it doesn't make any sense. Like, you know, wh wh where did the em Roman Empire end? It? I was told something around the 15th century, I presume, right? You know, wh what is the, that that uh, finished in the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire? That was not an empire, that was just an administrative partition of the, the empire that, uh, you know, when and, uh, you know, doesn't matter how big it was, you know, it still uh, came and went, like other chunks of the empire at this point. Um, and um, that's it. There is no end of any empire. Simple as that, right? It sort of doesn't even require an explanation. Um, 
the state, um, late antiquity chiefly, and this is addressed mostly in the uh, by the, the reforms of the late third beginning of the, the beginning of fourth century, was reorganized together with everything you know, political power, the the army, the institutions that began to present a different face properly. Right. Uh, this was not centralistic modern state, but uh, it expressed itself in uh, true even through images, through symbols, through, through certain languages and, and communicational strategies that we have to, to understand, in fact, through the sources very carefully. There was nothing properly standardized in it. Um, and he wor it was, however, a reinforced monarchy, we could say. You know, it was even more sacral and personal than in the previous centuries, right? Even in here, I don't open the digression of how sacral and personal the early Ro you know, Roman imperial authority actually was, because it's very complicated, and we we will have to make actually a lot of videos about this because it's it's very important even to understand the, the changes. But of course, the transition even there had already um, taken place. There is uh, an excess of um, let's say of um, zeal in in stressing this fact. Uh, you know, by the, the late Roman Empire now, um, you know, before technically even under Augustus, there was a republic. Now it's just like an uh, you know an absolutistic. Um, tyranny or some sort of by eastern influence um, this is a very uh, wrong also way of looking at the thing the, the Roman the Roman Empire the Roman power uh, must not be understood in in even in uh, Republican or early imperial times under the light of what we created in with you know the modern republics and democracies it has probably nothing to do with that um, of course the meaning we, we give to republic or democracy today um, is very different from the, the ones that was given at the time, where the, the terms were, were already there. Um, and especially, we should stress that the Roman Empire was never, but fundamentally, an oligarchy that always believed in the, um, of course, in the divine and military uh, legitimization uh, to, to rule. Uh, that ha was uh, utterly obsessed, like the world antiquity ever since, you know, classical Greece, um, with the deeds of Alexander, uh, right? With the w with a view of a very individualistic and uh, kind of warlike um, perception of whatever power and authority should be, right? The fact that that the Romans at a certain point achieved a balance that resembles something kind of republican was just oligarchic, actually cited by an ever you know growing uh, monarchic power um, is properly not presenting any form of you know kind of democratical or republican value in in the way we um, we intend if not if you know what the res publica actually is it, it's a very different thing actually from the, the same meaning of a republic proper and always remember that the empire is also something that existed since the dawn, uh, the, mm, the dawn of Rome, right? Um, the empire was not created at some point, right? The empire is not that our people technically start saying the first empire is when the Romans created the first provinces outside of Italy, so that they had kind of a colonialistic attitude. Well, it's first of all, let's be very careful with with words because even in here. Uh, it's not correct, but okay, I want to take that fine. Uh, it's when Augustus was, you know, proclaimed princeps, fine, choose that. But the point is that the imperium and its, uh, in fact, sacral military value existed since the very beginning. It was proper of whoever ruled in Rome, sword in hand, and technically Rome has always been an empire since the age of kings, since throughout all the Republic, because the, the only thing around which the any civil power gravitated was exactly the imperium as as it is defined right so even in here this ideas of for not speaking of another extremely important matter that is to say you know what is you know the transformation you know the perception of the same romans before the late roman empire like you, you think if you if caesar had look at hadrian he would have been happy about it or that you know if caesar had been seen by uh, Scipio Africanus, uh, Scipio would have been happy about him. Of course, there were massive cultural changes, and to say, oh, the now by the third, fourth century, there's this massive change, so it's it's late Roman Empire, guys, it's not the first thing anymore, actually, it's devoid of any mm, 
possibly intelligent sense you can't find. Um, changes happened. We're gradual. Today was stressing the other a few time ago I uh, made the video on the vexillationes under um, under Gallienus and seeing even in there how the, the, the change in the army it was something extremely gradual that had started because of these changes that started from even since the early imperial times if not even before right so it's ever more difficult to speak properly of late Roman times in a in a term that doesn't take more m narrowly into consideration a specific reality or you know a specific um, uh, element maybe a, even a more extended uh, timeline that uh, allows to, to, to observe the changes that are, are usually pretty low and also consider we don't know much about this world right it's not that the Roman Empire for all it's um, enormous infinite in um, you know unmeasurable uh, relevance to, to the whole history of mankind doesn't matter if you know there were peoples here that never even heard its name where it existed it doesn't have matters like you know the entire globe has been defined by this uh, and I don't even spend time to explain why um, but this thing is um, is not to be frameable in a, in a didactic concept right this thing should be taken at the same level of ex an existential challenge as a uh, f from from a, from an intellectual point of view, you can't think about the Roman Empire without being overwhelmed by whatever the the universality uh, of it truly meant, and encompassing realities that objectively at the time shared the same ideologies. Look at the Chinese Empire, right? It was exactly the same thing in many ways, and that's also what we don't study very much because uh, China had objectively a different. Uh, history afterwards to to bring the, its empire at at a different level than the, the Roman Empire, but you know the the sheer legacy of the Roman Empire is uh, for for the same China today, for example, very differently from whatever it can be for the Chinese Empire in the West, is um, is is incalculable properly. Um, so uh, even in here, during the so-called late Roman Empire, many sectors of economy. Uh, actually found a new dynamism after partial crises. The, the social contrasts were accentuated, but for example, they didn't cause massive uh, agitations. Now, this is important. You, you know, usually speak uh, when when you see the time of crisis, historically speaking, you know, a big freaking mess starts happening at some point. Objectively, throughout the third, fourth century, there wasn't a major break. Like you know, the population began to freak out, uh, to 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 rebel, uh, to 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 make secessionist attitude. It wasn't like that, right? And before you mention now uh, the Gallic Empire, the Palmyrene Empire, the Palmyrene Empire was borderline, you know, overlapping with different realities, including the uh, the 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 Sassanid uh, kingdom, the 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 you know the Roman Empire. It shared, of course, was had become part of it, but take the Gallic Empire was just an administrative division of the Empire which was perfectly fine with the existence of the Empire the, which they felt a unique thing with and they didn't have any you know intention to, to create another uh, thing or to, to overthrow it was just like someone some Roman general that managed to carve its own power in, in, in these provinces that were you know regularly also in previous centuries governed in a very decentralized fashion after all they had their own uh, autonomy and um, actually different uh, just even decisional processes on their own this is very important to stress we will have to make actually a video about how uh, books uh, like I don't know the one of Lutvak on the great strategy of the Roman Empire have generated this this impression that the Roman Empire was had somewhat a centralized command or that worked like a single like a monad that knew at every single time what whatever um, uh, forces it had at its own uh, control uh, throughout all over the, 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 the provinces, the, the boundaries, and so on. But it wasn't anything like that, actually. Um, there is, uh, uh, even in here, it's difficult to, to understand properly what was the degree of, um, you know, there is surely during the late Roman Empire an increased level of centralization. For reasons that even here are very difficult to explain, they have to do even the same social changes. Um, it wasn't properly, uh, you know, the result of a of a specific reform or strategy. But it was just a changing of, uh, of, of in in the Roman administration that had come to exist already by itself. Always, 
always remember this. The same goes for the politics, for the military. There is nothing that, you know, someone invents one day that enforces and here you have the reform and the thing changes from a day to another. Right? There is nothing in Roman history starting from all the, the, the military reforms that, the, uh, you know, the millennials war gaming uh, yeah, generation is, is fond of that, that actually happened because there was actually someone that reformed the army. Right? Uh, th these were things that the army had come to, to be already by themselves, that someone simply formalized, sanctioned, but didn't quite change much, and they were usually actually political reforms rather than military, strictly meant. Uh, that's actually very, very, very well known in today's uh, Roman historiography. Um, at the same time, we have a uh, definitely a new elan of cultural and religious life. We were saying before the conflict between um, Christianity and paganism gave a, a great vitality to one and the other, right? And it's the years 217, 400 that we finally see the appearance of uh, of advergency. <laughs> Let's say of uh, we could say of destinies, but that sounds too deterministic. Definitely, that, that separated the East and the West, right? That is also a very important chapter to stress. People say, "Ah, oh, it was a, a mistake to divide the empire." Well, it's also a very simplistic way of putting that. First of all, as we were saying before, there was no separation of any empire, right? The empires uh, that we think of were actually the same one. Uh, they were just administrative repartitions, once again, that always kind of backed each other, right? And it's very difficult to, to prove that they were actually two um, realities that were dramatically separated, for example, more than they had been for some time, historically speaking, right? Uh, at some point, think about... Uh, you know, it was not the first time, actually, with Theodosius and his sons that uh, the empire had gone split. Those are things that we see since the, the late Republic, um, and it happened countless times uh, during this, this various uh, centuries. So it's, uh, and even in there, what is that we mean also by, you know, that effective separ administrative separation? It wasn't there already, actually, and the administrative separation weren't or there already cities and uh, new centers of power that had, you know, rose in, rise into importance without, for example, even ever challenging the, 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 the primacy of Rome, right? So not that Rome at a certain point was abandoned, the, the, the capital was shifted somewhere else, so that's what people say, ah, that, that's Byzantine now, uh, that's not, his, his, you know, Roman history anymore. That never happened. Rome was always the capital of the empire throughout all uh, the, the world the time, right? Nobody, not even Constantine, actually founded Constantinople to think that that would have become like the capital of another empire, and even if you were to, to think of medieval times, Technically, Rome was perceived as, maybe at the time, not capital, also because they, uh, at a certain point after the 8th century, they, the Byzantines do not manage to control it anymore, but practically, um, so we don't know how the, the thing would have unfolded, but in a completely different um, scenario, as you understand. Uh, but technically speaking, the the concept of, of capital is uh, something very uh, modern, very bureaucratic. Like in these worlds, the the centrality of a city was mostly even, once again, usually religious, sacral, right? Rome was the, the foundation of the empire for the, the deities that had allowed it to, to rise. And eventually with Christianity, it's exactly the same. And there is a huge ecclesiological debate in that regard. We will see in a while to say, you know, but what, you know, what is that properly defines uh, the centrality of Rome? Uh, other enormous topic that, um, however, doesn't take away the fact that nobody ever thought that Rome was not the center of the world uh, anymore, right? Doesn't matter if cities like Trier or Milan or uh, Nice or Nicomedia or eventually Constantinople had already technically risen to you know, a greater, mostly strategical importance than Rome, or that Rome was largely, uh, you know, a parasitary capital. They didn't produce much, right? Just sucked um, the resources in. But once again, it was part of a wall that controlled the thing and that, you know, for, the, for which even the thing was, was functional. So all these kind of even moralistic judgments on 
you know, Rome, for example, in 406, um, you know, there was this massive wave uh, in the west of uh, Vandals, Alans, Swabians, right, in four, uh, 410, that over the swarm uh, into Gaul. Then in 410, Alaric uh, took Rome, right, but went away and uh, really not much happened. Right, in 410, you say, ah, oh, the gods took Rome, what a terrible thing, right, you know, there is this kind of uh, uh, exalted uh, ethnicism saying, ah, oh, look, the Germans mastered the Romans because they got Rome. No, they, they simply made the sack, it was controlled, uh, they took away most of their riches, they didn't destroy much, and they simply went away, and they were recognizing Roman authority all along. Um, and actually, they didn't uh, interfere even much with the thing, it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, Gothic women and children had been slaughtered just a year before, unmasked by the Roman Emperor. The the gods themselves feared as hell. This is what is should be stressed uh, all the time. The Roman god, right? They they had that. They were terrified at the idea that they would disregard these gods that r had created an empire that ruled the entire known world, and they they were extremely obsequious to it. And they, as you know pretty well they didn't care at all to destroy any empire but just to be part of it to share that same empire so which which also puts in perspective a lot of the idea of you know the, even in the territorialization uh, territorialization of the romano germanic kingdoms eventually as not properly as new identities but as you know as partakers to to the universal empire that we're constantly trying to imitate with a very few exceptions telling you the truth but that's we, if we enter in the early middle ages we will talk about it um, on another on another occasion. So um, uh, the um, the this like the end of the fourth century is usually seen now as, however, the the new uh, deep and uh, serious crisis. Right, uh, it was felt like even the sack of Rome, of course, was seen as a bad omen. But throughout all the the empire was actually a uh, a dark thing. Uh, it shook deeply the psychology. Even if actually not much happened at all, because it's not that any specific strategical balance was 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 actually created by that. Right. Um, the same uh, history of the gods throughout the 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 you know both the the west and, and the east in that time. But it proves that you know look at Stilicho. They he placed cat with with mice. You know, at least two or three times the gods could be wiped out if just uh, Stilicho had snapped, right? He didn't do that because he needed them. Um, but it, it's, this is not to say, you know, of course, I uh, we also made videos about the gods. We, we, that's, as I was saying before, I care very much about the other's perspective. I think the gods were, you know, very, very clever in their own regard and pro possibly the most Romanized ones that is the Visigoths were properly the ones that understood better this game and knew how to play it uh, 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 in the best way, right? And for which they should be uh, highly credited also because they had their own uh, their own reward in the end, having paid a, a tribute of blood for, for Rome in the Roman army uh, that also reveals it was not much of an opposition actually. Th that is not to deny naturally the uh, the enmity and the conflict to this. This is a very double. You, 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 this part of the history should always be followed on, on at least a double track, right? Of realizing what is, as always, the uh, the action and the thought, right? And what are the the the, the factors that really bring to um, to eventually the, the political and military actions without seeing in them a, a theological deterministic attitude that is to say this the you know that these two entities were opposed they were living to see what would happen in many ways right and this confrontational obsession of the clash of civilizations is unfortunately so deeply rooted in popular culture it is very difficult to substitute it with a healthier judgment maybe we're working at it right um, even in these times of apparent decline uh, in that is definitely concrete in many areas, but in others it was, a, you know, actually a, an important vitality, right? There are organisms like the church, for example, that managed to adapt brilliantly to the conditions created by history. They they actually prolonged late antiquity, right? I will not open this other parenthesis 
about the um, you know what is that you know when is was there something that defined this world and did it continue further right like like is you know did really antiquity end at some point or, or what we define as medieval is just the, the same thing actually um, not that, that they are identical but just you know does it even make sense to think that it was actually breaking uh, point right it, it's it's difficult to, to, to say actually I, I have built starting to build an opinion over time and it, I will express it at some point and um, we can say though that objectively uh, the separation between East and West brought not in the action of, of, of administrative split but simply for the reasons for, for which the split had become preferable right brought to the rise if you want of a new or the same at this point civilization that is the, the one uh, commonly defined as the, the Byzantine one and even here you know uh, I, I personally strongly reevaluated not the the term Byzantine in itself but properly the concept that wants to see um, in uh, in Constantinople because that's eventually what properly the the, 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 the center uh, broadly meant even in here tomorrow we have another chapter of Byzantine history it's these are all things I I don't even know what I'm talking about all this stuff altogether because I can't explain every single one uh, all the time but let's say that I, I reevaluate deeply let's say the the cultural uniqueness of what we define properly or improperly as Byzantine right um, uh, once again, I, when I say properly or improperly, I don't mean it because I think that was anything Byzantine. Of course, it was the same Roman Empire. It was point. There was just no debate about that. But if th there is a question of, you know, was there something there that that emerged like, or that had always been like that? There is an enormous continuity, for example, with certain elements of uh, Hellenic or Hellenistic culture that are surprisingly, strikingly um, similar to what we, de we have defined as a Byzantine world. And even in here we should start talking about, as, as, as far as the, 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 the so-called Hellenic Middle Ages, that now historiographers are s starting to realize that it, it possibly not even quite existed, that it was properly a, a, a great continuity with an enormous cultural um, you know, think even about the same Hellenic or Byzantine xenophobia that were objectively a thing, right? More than, way more than in other places of the world, possibly in the Mediterranean at the highest in some ways, uh, for reasons that are to be motivated, to, to be understood, first of all. And so it's as if that had been another thing, but it was another in the sense that it was already contained in the Roman empires ever since the Romans conquered Greece and other areas of the Hellenistic uh, East um, and it's another topic we should discuss in a completely different video because it's it's too important here I want just to stress that um, the, the what we we think like of the the eastern half of the Roman Empire or the, the Byzantine Empire wherever you wanna define it by this point because eventually you know that after 476 there was just a Roman Empire no Eastern Roman Empire by definition and it was probably it wasn't the East and Western wasn't properly an empire as we've already stressed but it was the result of a pain right uh, the the history of the Eastern half of the Roman Empire in this period is dramatic actually and actually way more than the Western Roman Empire. This is very important to understand, in my opinion, because it's, we think, you know, the Western Empire was was overrun by the barbarians, right? It, it didn't quite happen like that, right? Um, even in here, I can't digress, but for example, there was nothing deterministic about the empire having to end in the West. Was it was a deliberate political choice uh, to make it end. Um, it could have continued on, and also it wasn't probably overrun. There were certain areas that, of course, the empire couldn't control anymore. But the, until the, the last, uh, the very last decade of the Western Roman Empire, you know, um, 
the the system of Italy and Pannonia and Dalmatia could you know had the, the resources technically to to reconquer largely especially Spain and Africa things went otherwise um, Geyseric actually was the the guy who made the difference at that point in Carthage where that was crashing out by the way uh, an Eastern Roman fleet not even a Western Roman one um, but another proof that these two parts were actually connected in one way or another. But if you look at the history of the eastern half of the empire, that that's way more dramatic than the west, right? Uh, the west had, you know, had it relatively easy, right, compared to the east. Right? It's true that there were these avalanches of peoples that were turned mostly to towards the west. But uh, for the Huns, we should point out that that Attila didn't have any interest in destroying the empire on the contrary he cared and preserved the western roman empire because otherwise it couldn't uh, you know uh, crop that cow milk that cow excuse me crop the cow how, how did i think that um but um the mm, secondly the think about the gods think about uh, first the visigoths at the beginning and we've already seen that uh, at that point uh, you know stilico could actually Got got rid of them. It didn't. But even the Ostrogoths. Eventually, what did they do in the West? Actually, they reinforced pretty damn well uh, the the Roman government in Italy. That was, by the way, still Roman government because the same Roman elites were even in there after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Were, were, were surprise, surprise, were were ruling in the same exact way. So another reason to conceive actually 476 is a purely formal and basically insignificant if anything if, you know uh, maybe just from a legalistic point of view um, in a legitimizing sense for the, the, the you know international relations but uh, Roman society still existed it still existed in Burgundy uh, as it still existed in Aquitaine it still existed in Spain in Africa by the way you know the terrible vandals that conquered Africa there is no proof that there was uh, destruction persecution um, you know th those are things we we began to think just looking at the epistolar uh, you know um, communications between the popes and, and and Constantinople that had reasons to define the vandals in a certain way and therefore the vandals became in fact the vandals these bands of tags but actually the vandals didn't you know, they weren't nor better or worse than the than the barbarian average. They, the, uh, specifically of the Germanic or whatever, if they were Germanic or Proto-Slavic or, or a mix, actually, because the Vandals came from an area that was overlapping Germanic, Celtic, and and Proto-Slavic, seemingly, world. But that's also another uh, question, just to make you understand how the thing is absolutely not as easy as, as it seemed. And that what we define as um, Byzantine, and I say, I say it because I detest the term Eastern Roman, telling you the truth, because to me it, doesn't, it purely doesn't mean anything, right? Uh, we don't, we never use it for defining Western Roman, where it actually was a, a Western and Eastern split, um, and especially when it, after 476, by definition, was no Eastern West, it was just a Roman Empire, point, right? Um, and I, I stress it, I repeat it endlessly every time. But just for s explaining to you how, however, the the, the so-called eastern part uh, at some point came to be compacted and you know strengthened even by these uh, attacks uh, that were coming from the wall surroundings, right? Except the west, um, but the wall Eurasian Pontic step in the Near East, in the Middle East. Um, was a, f a, a constant avalanche of, of peoples, and 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 the Mantus hostilis brings to to a greater cohesion. That aside from that, of course, you know, had to do also with uh, the the enormous wealth, especially monetary wealth of of the East. Um, lots of other factors. Even in here, it's not a monofactorial explanation, but it was the same system that had to stand against those um, uh, those uh, threats and that made it and that therefore kind of reinforced its belief in itself and its values those even that preceded romanization and gave birth in fact to what we decided to define byzantine not for insulting everybody if we still use it in modern times after you know we have we we know pretty well what the whole thing is about and the, the field 
of study is still called Byzantinistics for a reason, for the same people that perfectly can perfectly teach you why the term Byzantine is improper, but that choose to be called Byzantinists because objectively the term is way more semantically and historically rich, um, historiographically, let's say better, rich than, than we, we think. And it poses an enormous amount of questions that very few people actually care about. So I would pass to the sources and stressing, first of all, um, naturally the, the diversity of these, like the, uh, that should, you know, you should always address with the, uh, with the properly critical spirit, knowing that every category poses very uh, different and enormous problems of actually on their own to, to be interpreted like. So the literary sources are obviously the most useful, right? Don't don't think that we know the ancient world mostly through archaeology, because that's not actually true, right? Um, what we know about the ancient world in terms of sheer history is thanks to literary sources, right? And there is no way out of that, right? Um, stones do not speak, right? Even when they have something written on it, right? There is the literary sources are dramatically more insightful. Um, dramatically more uh, actually answering the same problems that in, a, in many ways we're posing ourselves today, right? Obviously in a completely different context, but still writing for the sake of saying, you know, I want to write this now so that people will understand in the future what this thing was about, right? This is not what, you know, the archaeological datum is fundamental, it's extremely precious, it's unique, we couldn't do without it, but at the same time it should be brought up by archaeologists and then historians should look at it uh, in a way that we we can't properly give it a, a dimension t together with this bra broader um, you know, uh, understanding that we derived from, uh, from, other, uh, from other acquisitions. Naturally, we also have to distinguish banally between and, and neatly between the primary sources, so that this when the author has le everybody has a definition of this stuff. You know, well, what is historiography? What is source? Be the the primary, secondary? What is a document? Right? There is an enormous, uh, enormous, you know, um, uh, historiography about this definition. Um, but to make it, you know, somewhat simple, so when the author has lived moments that he's describing, roughly. Um, the secondary sources naturally are second-hand works, so that mostly, you know, take from other written sources. And therefore, even if they add something original, are essentially given, you know, accepting at least, and that that's very important, historically speaking, the validity of, of the other sources. Uh, then there is Latin and Greek literatures, right, so there are two distinct things. They also loosely belong to, to, to different areas, right? Um, and we'll see it more clearly at some point. So regarding to the contents, we uh, firstly highlight the importance of authors that dedicated themselves to the traditional literary genres. Um, so we'll naturally look at historiography proper, at, at the historians, um, such as, for example, the Amianus Marcellinus and the anonymous author of the Historia Augusta, right? Amianus was a Latin historian, was born uh, in uh, in Antioch by a Greek family, so he wrote, uh, meaning he wrote in Latin, so um, perhaps around 332-333 AD he became a helper of the Magister Equitum Ursicinus, he followed him in Milan, in Cologne, in Gaul, right at the imperial court in Sirmium and he participated to the wars against the Persians. So he saved himself at the siege of Amidus in 359. Four years later he followed Emperor Julian in the new campaign against the pa Persians. Then he had his farewell to arms, let's say he visited various regions. He went to Rome where he attended um, in the last years of the century to the writing of his own uh, historical work uh, that is entitled uh, Rerum Gestarum Libri, right? Um, that basically encompassed the period goes from Nerva, so where actually Tacitus had stopped writing, to the one of Valens, right? So it's basically between 96 to 378 AD. 
but the first third in box so the ones that arrived up to the year 252 went lost so the what we have um, has great importance for the uh, events that were contem contemporaneous to the to the author himself and uh, and uh, he Ammianus is a great source because especially for late Roman standards he he is very serious methodologically speaking very open-minded he's impartial in many ways and also in especially in front of the religious clashes uh, the style is uh, is on uh, you know averagely inspired to the school rhetorics at the time but what concerns the Storia Augusta instead, well, it's um, actually a collection of biography of the imperial age in the 4th century that comprehended the lives of emperors, Caesars, um, those who had pretended, uh, you know, the, the throne or had usurped it from Hadrian to Numerianus. So we we actually have this work with a with a with an important gap. Uh, from Philip the Arab to the beginning of the life of Balerian, right? So, from 245 to 253, there are very important years. And the biographies that make work are uh, traditionally attributed to six authors, right? Um, Elius Spartianus, Julius Capitolinus, Volca Volcatius Gallicanus, Elius Lampridius, Tribellius, uh, Paulio, Flavius Vopiscus. And according to the dedications uh, made and to certain you know you know uh, addressing made to Diocletian and Constantine these lives would have been composed in the period of these latter emperors right it makes it even more interesting um, however um, th there is generally speaking uh, an enormous problem about of the dating now we, we can't descend in, in into details then there are the epitomists, who are very characteristic of late antiquity, um, just as, for example, the series of dates provided in the so-called chronographer of the year 354 that um, occupy a ever more relevant place in literary production. The chronographer of 254 is the conventional definition, let's say, of a, this collection of texts that are prevalently chronographical that was uh, accomplished in the year 354 by work of Furius Dionysius Philocalus who was a calligrapher and man of letters in general and it's basically a list of the consuls up to 354 there is a, an eastern canon uh, and then a, a list of the prefects of Rome between 254 and 354 a list of martyrs, the so-called Depositio Martyrum, and of the popes, Depositio Episcoporum, that were venerated in Rome, the so-called Catalogus Liberianus, the, um, a double writing of the um, Roman consular Fasti, or the Fasts, a universal chronicle, the Chronica Orosi, and a chronicle of the emperors of Rome up to Licinius, in a description of Rome by regions. Among other epitomists, uh, some of the most famous ones were definitely Aurelius Victor, Eutropius and Festus. So Aurelius Victor uh, was a 4th century Roman historian of African origin. He was governor of the uh, Pannonia Secunda, right, the Nubian province, and prefect of the Urbs. So, very high post in, uh, in the imperial um, administration in Rome at the time of Theodosius. And he wrote a history of the empire known as the Caesares from Augustus up to 360. He was a pagan, interestingly enough, and he had this um, kind of moralistic intonation and kind of especially biographical character in his work. His principal sources were Suetonius. Um, and for the most recent part, actually, uh, he had um, a source in common with Eutropius, as we'll see. Um, and the, the, there is a real aberration in the first part, which is the uh, anonymous uh, epitome, the Ces uh, Caesaribus, right? That was united to other anonymous works, the Origo Gentis Romane and the De Viris Illustribus Urbis Rome.
which altogether constituted a complete manual of Roman history, was very, very known and used during the Middle Ages. Eutropius was another Latin historian. He was uh, an epistographer, right? He was actually the magister memorius, the master of memory of balance. Uh, you know, Eastern em Roman Emperor, 364, famous 378, uh, for on behalf of Rome wrote the uh, so-called breviarium ab urbe condit. Right, it was a summary of Roman history from the origins to 364 AD in ten books, and um, the the work is in prose, uh, has a simple and clear prose. Uh, it's almost epigraphical for its brevity almost to the scale, right? And it draws from several, you know, sources. It was translated in Greek by Pianus in around 380 and by Capita between the 5th, the, the end of the 5th, the beginning of 6th century. Then eventually was re-modified uh, and continued by Paul the Diacon in, in, the, in the 8th century up to the time of Justine and eventually by Landolfus Sagasx in the, 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 the 11th century up to Leo Artmanus, but this is not but this is just for saying that it would become thus in the Middle Ages the Historia Michelle. Right? It was another important historiographical work uh, read at the time. Sex uh, Festus, actually Sextus Pompeius Festus, right? He was a Latin grammarian. Probably we don't know. Actually some put it in uh, the second century AD. Right, he was author of a alphabetic compendium in eight, uh, in twenty books. Right, of the work of Valerius Flaccus, De Verborum Significatione. The uh, the Festus uh, Epitomus has been um, you know reworked even here by Paul the Diacon in the eighth centuries. Has arrived to us actually with important gaps. Uh, and is, however, very precious as a source of linguistical and antiquarian news. So, um, in second place, there are, in fact, among these authors, important orators and uh, epistolographers, let's say, we have the panegyrics, the discourses, and the letters of Libanius, Julian, and Symmachus. Right? Um, these authors, Libanius was... Um, a Greek writer of Antioch, he lived in during throughout all the, the, the fourth century. Basically, he was master of John Chrysostomus and friend of Julian, emperor. Right, so uh, he taught in Constantinople, Nicaea, Nicomedia, Athens, and uh, Antly in Antioch. And he actually lived. Uh, you see this Eastern reality where he lived uh, as a as a Hellenic so sophist practically. Uh, he he wrote an immense amount of work um, that was split already at, at the time in orations, declamations, and letters, and uh, he had mostly a historical interest. Of the sixty-four orations, right, uh, are uh, interested also are interesting um, those, for example, that refer to Julian, that uh, are important to to you know highlight in a way the, the attitude of Hellenism towards Christianity right so also it's important for the things we we're talking about before whether the connection you know think about Julian's policy uh, but also the coexistence of the two religious systems then there are the declamation the disclaimers I don't know how to, to call it them there, there are like 50 there are of mythological historical and um, you know erudite kind um, on fictional topics the eighth volume contains the exercises sort of scholastic exercises sentences famous you know quotes uh, commonplaces literally um, and mm, they some historians have actually doubted of the or even of that the author actually wrote all of this stuff, so, but there is seemingly no convincing proof that he wasn't really the author of that. There are news um, in the discourses of Demosthenes uh, with a life on the orator. The 10th and 11th volumes contain the letters that are 
something like 1500 right it's the richest from all the antiquity they are important for uh, the knowledge of uh, the Banis in his times and there's to be remembered that also uh, he wrote an apology of Socrates and while it seems to be actually um, ap an apocryph the correspondence with Basil of Caesarea at the same time of Julian we have actually only eight um, discourses among which we remember the Elogia of Constance the second and of Eusebia the message to the Athenians written at the time of the rebellion against Constantius um, and the Laudas to the son and to the mother of the gods in which the emperor manifests um, you know with enthusiasm his religious convictions there are other satirical to other satirical works the um, the Caesars and the Saturnalia, right? I, the the hater of the bird that is uh, like a booklet against the Antiochians that had proven, you know, cold towards the renewed paganism and had laughed uh, at Julian because of his philosophical beard, and the letters also that are the best work for the uh, of the author for the. Um, you know, the warmth, I would say, the sincerity of expression of Julian. It is a precious document for knowing his thought, right? And, and the one of the society of, of his time. Um, for what concerns Symmachus, Quintus Aurelius Symmachus, he was a Latin panegyrist. He lived from 340 to 402. He was son of Lucius Aurelius Avianus Symmachus that had important public um, offices and great honors in Rome and Constantinople. He was educated by Gallic writers and he composed in his youth two panegyrics for Valentinian I, one for his son, uh, the Caesar Gratian, and in 373 he was proconsul of Africa and as a senator in 383 uh, and if, um, f proud defender of paganism and of Roman tradition was in polemics with St. Ambrose that opposed the placing of the uh, statue of the goddess victory in the ara of the Roman Curia, right? And therefore he was Prefectus Urbe in 384 and Council in 391. We have of Symmachus other f uh, five incomplete or orations, 40, 49 official relations um, the third was pronounced in front of Valentinian II that has, you know, is about the controversy for the era of the victory. It's pervaded of sincere commotion. It's um, written with uh, fluid elegance. There is this new genre that has to, you know, uh, essentially become ever more uh, stylistic, but stylized, but uh, at the same time surging the innovation. Uh, within the, the, these boundaries, this is very important and kind of, uh, especially for these literates of court, in many ways, it's becoming the new challenge that will be typical, the panegyric, you know, in, in Byzantine society as a proper part of the court ritual of of, of the emperor and of the public uh, public discourse and, and, and debate. Um, we have also ten books of letters uh, stylized on uh, the model of Pliny that are rich of, of, of uh, you know information on events and uh, people of the time. And uh, on Symmachus, the tenth book contains the correspondence of, of the emperors um, that he had with the emperors. I mean, and Symmachus also uh, studied uh, Livy. Uh, he he actually made a review. Uh, of him, of, of his work, uh, as the the author was, uh, as Livy was for for Symmachus, one um, of, of his models of um, the ideal models of auctoritas and of the mos maiorum. And um, Symmachus' work is of great interest, such as you know, it it it, um, it shows like the the great expression of a world that now is being surpassed in some ways. You know, the way it, uh, appears to be um, naturally very, very uh, rhetorical, right? In a formal and typical way, but uh, it's still very sui generis, uh, if you want. Then we have Ausonius poetry, 
right that it provides information on the daily life of the powerful right the um, Ausonius um, was a Latin poet he was no he was born in Burtigala that is Bordeaux um, in uh, 310 AD and he died uh, after 300 393 he was first uh, master of rhetorics in Portugala eventually was a prefect of Gaul and eventually of Italy and of Illyria and Africa and since 367 he was a preceptor in Trier of Gratian that having become emperor made him consul so when Gratian was killed in 383 uh, Ausonius came back as a private uh, citizen, let's say, in Trier and eventually home in Burtigala. And Ausonius is the typical representative of the Gallo Roman culture in a time of crisis. He brought, uh, you know, he drew from this, um, let's say, the chance to write verses were technically elaborated, and uh, um, with this, you know, uh, such as epigrams, epitaphs, um, some idyllies, letters, right? Also, a uh, nu um, nuptial sentence in Virgilian verses and ephemeris, a sort of poetical diary. Um, of poetical value is um, it's the so-called Moselle, right? Indeed, it's a, a poem of in um, 483 examiners that he wrote uh, in describing uh, a, a, a trip from Bingen to Trier uh, with um, particular, you know, freshness, spontaneity. He wrote uh, some, uh, you know, sm small poetry about Bissula, that was the name of a Germanic slave that had been given to him as a prey of war. And not even Christianity. Uh, you know, considering he might have converted actually after 265, actually, you know, seemed to have changed his uh, sensitivity um, in his literary style, right? Um, he, both in the Parentalia and in, in the Commemoratio Professorum Burdigalensium, that are two ep epigram or collections, we mentioned also the Epistolary of St. Augustine, that we will talk about in a while with about the, the author eventually, but um, um, we introduce in this sense the, the great innovation of the time that is the extraordinary development of the Christian literature. Right. We can't speak of the Aryan crisis now, but let's say that, uh, you know, you know what the point was actually with Arianism and how was the, the pro and post to orthodoxy, the Nicene Creed was defined actually against Arianism in Constantinian times and this allowed uh, actually, you know, it, it was the same moment in which, in fact, the, the, the Christians were first allowed in the highest posts, even of, of the state literature. So, this is the moment in which there is a structured, let's say, block of um, of Christian orders that rises, I think, also with very high qualitative standards. You can't speak of, for example, the talent of Eusebius of Caesarea and Saint uh, uh, Athanasius, right? That are uh, very important points of of, of reference. Eusebius was, as you know, this uh, Christian uh, writer born in 265, roughly, and died in Caesarea in Palestine. Around 339 of 340, he is considered to be the father of ecclesiastical history. He studied and worked in the library of Caesarea. He was bishop of the city in 313. Right, and he's famous for his theological, uh, theological thought and for the uh, cultured works uh, that he composed, um, and uh, among which there is the evangelical preparation. Albeit the fundamental historical work is naturally the ecclesiastical history, that are basically ten books in the uh, final uh, writing that uh, tells us of events that began since the beginning of the church. Uh, up to 324. He was friend and disciple of Pamphilos of Caesarea and that, as we've seen, we, it was this great, uh, had this great library, had been founded by Origenes and was in fact reordered by Pamphilos and uh, uh, by Eusebius and that, that's where in the, you know, 
he he had taken the name from right uh, as Eusebius of Caesarea. He was imprisoned during the persecution of 303 311, in which Pamphilus died, and in which Eusebius had began to write an apology for Origenes that was lost, and he, as we've seen, became in 313 around uh, right those years bishop of Caesarea. Right, and the admiration towards Origenes definitely characterizes Eusebius' theological position. Um, with the subordination in the um, sub subordinationism proper in the Trinitarian problem brought to sympathize both with uh, with Arius, right, and actually welcome him to him and, and eventually to be excommunicated by the Council of Antioch in three hundred and twenty five. But eventually um, after a while in Nicaea after having proposed as a symbol of fate the baptismal creed in his life, uh, he accepted referencing it to the logos, the consubstantial terms, because it was wanted by the emperor. So, uh, by Constantine, Eusebius, with the anonymous name of Bishop of Nicomedia, also kept to patrocinate Arius and to accuse St. Athanasius, you will see, in fact, now, for which he obtained the condemnation entire in 335, and also Marcel of Ansir, with whom he uh, you know, polemized with the works against Marcellus and of the ecclesiastical theology. And after a while in Constantinople, Eusebius held the panegyric in uh, the occasion of the 30 years of, uh, of, um, of Constantine that honori uh, honored him, right, you know, 30 years of glory, and he, and he was rewarded by him with great devotion and uh, ever since he was always considered as a courtesan bishop, admired for his education, um, debated b for his character, and also suspected in uh, in orthodox terms, right? You know, um, and um, Athanasius of Alexandria, or also known as Athanasius the the Great, was another father and doctor of the Church. He was born in Alexandria, two hundred ninety-five, or, or right around there and died there in 373. He was Bishop of Alexandria. He fought tenaciously against Arianism, uh, for which he was exiled twice. You know, Arianism at some point was actually supported by the Empire. Um, and he was author of apologetic and dogmatic works. He was a polemical writer. He was clear in his ideas, was you know, effective in expressing them, even if, you know, maybe they always a, a fully, you know, lucid sense, but were extremely deep. But you know, among his works, uh, there's the life of Antony that contributed uh, in a, de you know, determined way to the spread of the Egyptian monastic movement in, in the West. You know, the Antonius and Pacomius, the, the founder of the Eastern, you know, Christian monasticism, eventually spread in the West. And uh, Athanasius is a um, figure of primary importance in the history of Christianity. And of, of his doctrines, nothing sure is known, let's say, uh, um, uh, about his first activity, mostly, before he was elected Bishop Alexander in 328, right? He, was, he wasn't surely extraneous to the great conflicts that uh, perturbated the time, the Egyptian church, the Malaysian schism, and the Aryan controversy that was began under Bishop Alexander died in 328 and culminated at the Council of Nicaea in 325, but it seems that Athanasius, when was still a deacon, was um, a helper of Alex uh, Alexander, right, earning, uh, for this reason, the hatred of the Arians. And uh, the Arians, in fact, opposed his election. In this word, they were uh, helped by the Malaysians, and they hoped to obtain at Alexander's death a different system of election of the Alexandrian bishop that could give more importance to the the Egyptian and not the Alexandrian clergy. And Athanasius instead avoided every innovation, maybe with a with a coup right for some years he the, the two oppositions flowed, giving rise to the ferocious clash for which um you know Alexander had to, to, to fight throughout all the his bishopric and that would bring him many times in exile among remarkable perils and this clash was worsened by the interference that the emperors 
wanted to have in the ecclesiastical affairs needed to have for the stability of Alexander of Egypt. This was dramatically important for the stability of, uh, of the empire, Constantinople. Um, and, and and also because he had, Athanasius had a, you know, impetuous character, right? You know, the principal phases of this clash were the first travel in Constantinople where he had to, uh, you know, uh, fight against the accusers uh, moved by the Malaysians and the Aryans um, by Constantine in 231-32. Then the Council uh, of Tyre that was concluded with the first exile decreed in 335 um, and Alexander would come back by 337. And the Council of Antioch 339 that declared him decayed and uh, appointed Gregory at his own place. Um, Alexander at that point um, fled by Julius of Rome that always defended him. It was the Council of Sardes in 343 that determined the definitive break between the Aryans, the so-called Easterners and the Westerners, but that allowed the coming back of Athanasius to Alexander by intervention of the Western Roman Emperor Constance in 346. And then there was another exile that was decreed by the Emperor Constance that um, uh, sent him to Alexander, um, um, sent against him to Alexander another usurper, was George 356. Then uh, he came back um, with the arrival of Julian, right, in 362. That, however, brought him away another time for motives of political security. So the definitive coming back, uh, aside from a brief parenthesis under Valens in 364, was under Jobin. And throughout all his life, Athanasius was at the center of this, as he understood, doctrinal and political controversies that agitated the church. He was a man of action, uh, even just from a religious point of view. He was a good uh, thinker and um, uh, literary author. And uh, he naturally needed to explain his life and activity. His work was uh, considered very important by the Orthodox Church, naturally as an anti-Aryan point of reference, and already by the 5th century uh, there were collections of it at Constantinople in Antioch that became canonic, right? And this work, um, you know, uh, are is split in the apologetic, let's say, um, in the apologetic type and the dogmatic type, right? The first one is mostly defending, uh, it's a kind of an autobiographical defensive exposure of the, the problems he had faced. Um, and the first one, in fact, was systematized in a way to follow step by step the events from the beginning of the Aryan crisis in 333 to Sardes with the Apologia Contrarianus and the Morte Ari, right? The exile, 356, with Historia Arianorum, and the Apologia ad Constantium and the Apologia di Fuga. And among the dogmatic works instead are comprehended two juvenile books against the pagans, three books against the Arians, and a work on the decisions of the Nicene Council, three letters on the uh, Holy on the Holy Ghost, and in, for important and different motives it's mostly life of Antony that contributed, as we've seen, greatly to the knowledge and the spread in the West of the Egyptian monastic movement. Uh, the festal letters that the Bishop of Alexander sent every year to the faithful uh, during f in occasion of Easter, and that touched uh, moral, theological, and even, you know, you know, kind of live actuality topics of di different types. And uh, important is, for example, the one of 367 that is partially preserved also in Greek. The others, for example, are preserved in, in Syrian and Coptic, right? You know, and that is contained in the biblical canon of uh, Athanasius. That is, for the Old Testament, the the Hebrew one. That is, in order to um, that by recommending as a pious letter the um, the Deuterocanonics, except the Maccabeans, the the New Testament, right? That would uh, the one would become the classical one, and with the recommendation for Hermas and the Didache, right? And uh, Athanasius is uh, basic, especially foremost, a polemical writer when he uh, deals with historical and personal 
uh, topics and also when he actually confronts with the theological arguments and he mm, he is um, naturally he has this this particular type of expression it's mostly a literary thing now it's not particularly important because but the, the important thing is here his um, his life right his personal conduct his coherence and energy right all his um, that is reflected in his style that is clear and uh, and effective uh, in many ways um, so mm, in in this field of ecclesiastical literature we can also distinguish true and real regional local schools for example the ones flourished uh, in Cappadocia think about St. Basil, St. Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus and St. Gregory of N Nyssa for example Basil of Caesarea famously a doctor of the church was son of uh, the Saints Basil and, 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 and Melia he, he was brother to Gregory of Nyssa and of Peter of Sebastus and he studied uh, at home let's say in uh, Caesarea and Cappadocia he lived from 330 to 379, right then eventually in Constantinople in Athens, where he was connected to his deep friendship <coughs> with Gregory Nazianzus uh, of Nazianzus, and he uh, taught re rhetoric in Caesarea in 356, and after the uh, baptism, he went through Egypt, Palestine, Syria, and Mesopotamia between 357 and 8, knowing this ascetic life that he practiced in his um, possession on the Iris River and here uh, the uh, Gregory of Nazianzus also reached him and from the Bishop Eusebius he was ordered as priest but you know having differences with him he came back to a solitary life and then eventually he brought um, himself to Caesarea to fight against Arianism that had re re been reborn under the Emperor Valens so he, when he was eventually elected bishop uh, with contrasts actually in 270 kept fighting against heresy demanding the support of Pope Damasus and uh, the, the Westerners right against the Aryans and uh, it's important works as in, in this sense the uh, the homilies very important the dogmatics uh, dogmatic texts like the one of the Holy Ghost um, uh, of 374 and the the epistolary that uh, as we have seen Gregory of Nazianzus you know he was also father and doctor of the church uh, he was born in uh, close to Nazianzus in fact in Cappadocia in 330 he died there in 390 and was together with Saint Basil and Gregory of Nyssa one of the great Cappadocian fathers right he he was a uh, master of rhetoric he became Bishop of Sazima and eventually of Constantinople um, uh, was an office that he abandoned actually after uh, a while in 381 well he, he prefer, preferred to come back to Nazianzus when he was author of 45 discourses he, he wrote this large amount of letters 245 he also wrote in verses right he authored uh, this uh, some most example uh, you know oldest examples of um, um, of accentuative metrics in in Greek, right? And he was um, son, as we've seen, of the Bishop Gregory. Uh, he studied in Caesarea and Cappadocia, where he knew Basil. And eventually, uh, after uh, his studies in Caesarea and Palestine and Alexandria, he uh, became a disciple, right, with the future uh, Emperor um, uh, Julian in uh, in the in Tespeus in Athens right he was baptized uh, in uh, eventually in Constantinople he taught uh, rhetoric in Nazianzus he visited often the um, the Neo Caesarea with where he, there was Basil as we've seen and and with him he composed the Philokalia right that is this collection of passages from Origenes and he wanted uh, to get away in this uh, hermetic, um, so, you know, priesthood, let's say that was conferred to him by his father, and that instead, um, you know, he ended up to for for helping in the place. And when Basil, Archbishop of Caesarea, created new dioceses, Gregory was chosen as a new bishop of Sasmandi. He preferred, however, solitude 
uh, even if he kept working with with the father um, uh, once again so after the decree of Theodosius that prescribed orthodoxy as uh, you know the, the, fa uh, the, the, the fate of Pope Damasus and Peter of Alexandria Gregory was called in Constantinople to preach against the Arians and in spite of the maneuvers of Maximus known as the Sinecus he was elected bishop in a council that was presided by Meletius of Antioch and when this died after a while and uh, um, with the um, the the Antiochene schism had been you know protracted uh, during um, the after the election of Flavianus it was not less um, uh, orthodox than Paulinus Gregory was you know criticized he was um, he resigned in 281 and he came back in Antiochus when he, he remained for two years and eventually he came back to his uh, native city and he was especially uh, an orator right we have this uh, 45 discourses as we have seen uh, that have a quite uncertain chronology um, and um, that the, there are uh, these epitaphs also for the brother Caesarius for the sister Gorgon and father St. Basil and the apology for his escape after the um, you know sacerdotal order he had received there are five theological orations on the Trinity this as we've seen massive epistolary of 245 letters some are debated uh, in their authenticity um, and he wrote also in verses um, it's famous his Carmen and his own life in this jumping uh, trimeters and there are the exhortations to um, a virgin to offer the ancient examples of metric accentative um, uh, poems in Greek right and um, Gregory of Nyssa right Gregory of Nyssa also was this one of the great Cappadocian fathers he was born in Caesar yeah, as well in 235 around there and um, and in Nyssa died uh, in 394 about 394 he was one of uh, you know he was a good knower of Plato interestingly enough and he was deeply influenced by Origenes but also by Methodius of Olympus and he was one of the most speculative let's say of the Greek fathers of the fourth century he was a fierce enemy of Arianism he wrote important theological works such as the against the Onomius, in various treatises sermons and letters he was born in a Christian family was a writer but he felt this impulse of ascetic life that was embraced by his brother Saint Basil as we've seen by the, the sister Macrina and by the friend Gregory of Nazianzus and he reached the brother at Annes where he uh, began to study the Bible and the ecclesiastical uh, writers he um, when Basil became Bishop of Caesarea in 370 um, he had him elected in Nyssa, but the vicar of Pontus Demosthenes managed to have him deposed, and after his comeback in 378, having his, you know, his brother having died, he found himself at the head of the Orthodoxes in the East and participated to the Second Ecumenical um, you know, Council of Constantinople in 381, so much that Theodosius designated his fate as a model of Orthodoxy, and Gregory defended it, in fact, especially against the Demonian Arian Eunomius, right, against uh, um, uh, Apollinaris of Laodicea and the Pneumatomachy, uh, right, and in his vast pro theological production, most important work is, uh, in fact, the Contra Eunomium, that as uh, the aforementioned against Eunomius. Uh, that is a union of three smaller works written in different times is connected to the Trinitarian disputes right even if um, um, the the spirit um, the spiritu sancto uh, and the against the pneuto machines you know and to the Trinitarian disputes is connected also the the spiritu sancto and against the pneuto machines and, uh, and uh, next to these, we remember also the Animate uh, Resurrection and the Great Catechesis, right? The, in Latin, it's the Oratio Catechica, uh, Catechetica Magna, 
and other treatises in which the there is a criti you know there is a criticism to origins like the, the virginitat that was perhaps his first work the opificio hominis de vita moises and the life of saint macrine and other exegetical works the ex uh, same man on um, Explicatio Apologetica, in which he continues the homilies of St. Basil. And um, there are many sermons and the very important epistolary, um, as we've seen as well. Um, this was for the Cappadocian fathers were concerned in Antioch of Syria. Instead, we mostly remember John Chrysostomus, the father of the church, the most famous of the, you know, holy orators, right? He was born in Antioch between 344 354 and he died in Coman in Cappadocia in 407. He was educated with great care, um, you know, by the rhetor Libanius and in the Christian religion by the bishop Melatius and by the Doris of Tarsus that led for some time. Um, that it, you know, and he led for some times also some ascetic life as a monk eventually in Anachoresis. And in order to subtract to the honor and burden actually of the bishoprics, he came back eventually to Antioch where he was ordered as a diacon in 381 by Melesius and priest in 386 by Flavian. And in 397, at the death of Nectarius, he um, was uh, called to the Patriarchate of Constantinople by the Emperor Arcadius um, for counsel of the powerful ministry, uh, the minister Eutropius. Right? And with this, John entered uh, in collision, let's say, um, with, um, uh, with the, for s supporting essentially the l m right to protection to asylum of which he had to eventually profit the same Eutropius eventually and his appointment had already discontented Theophilus of Alexandria the measures were taken in the uh, travel across Asia in 401 um, especially uh, against these uh, simoniac bishops procured to the uh, intolerant John you know other enemies while uh, against him acted also his substitute in Constantinople, Severianus of Gapala. And John, however, reconciled with him and having intervened even Eudosia, that protected him in for some time, um, he ended up to adhere to Theophilus. He was irritated even more when John uh, interceded for the Origenian monks that he had kicked uh, out, basically, and he suscitated against John um, I mean, this suscitated against John the, you know, the contempt of Epiphanius of Salamina, for example. And um, therefore, after Theophilus, um, you know, when came back to Constantinople with many bishops of his party, managed to make, to have John condemned. Um, when he was absent, by the way, of the synod, so-called of the Oak, that was, uh, you know, the name of an imperial villa where he but that this this was uh, summoned in 403. John was deposed and he uh, went to Bithynia and the people was in disarray uh, obtained, I mean in, you know, uh, oppressed he um, obtained he, him to, to come back and Eudosia also connecting to the fact that um, you know, he was a legitimate obtained a new condemnation so John was exiled again very harshly in different places up to the death and the, in his numerous writings we remember the three books against the adversaries of the monastic life, the six on the dialogue on the priesthood, various ascetic works on virginity on those that tempt the you know the co-inhabiting virgins, that's kind of interesting in this sense, and discourses you know the fame of orator and you know uh, also Provoked to him, the brought to him the the nickname of Goldmund, right? You know, and uh, of exegesis. Think about the epistle of um, Saint Paul and the Psalms and so on. And he followed the method of the Antiochene school. Um, you know, he he moral, for example, against the theaters and the circus games on the mysteries. 
for the, the degrees of solemnity. Also apologetic against the Jews, um, the, the Amnone, uh, um, Anomayans, on the, un the fact that God cannot be known. Uh, the work on uh, Eutropius after his fall by the one of statues because of the riots in Antioch in 387 and there's an enormous correspondence right you know um, he wasn't much of a regional philosopher theologian but you know he echoes right John echoes and transfers effectively in diomelitic diomelitic topics that are proper of the Greek patristics and especially of the Antiochian school right he was John was essentially moralist right he was desiderous to transform Christian life according to the ideal of the mm, the Christian primitive communities conceived in the Cenobitic um, frame fundamentally so um, then there is in Alexandria definitely this other figures that I think we discussed in um, elsewhere, I don't remember exactly where about Origenes, that we don't have the time to fully discuss, but you know, he was this Neoplatonic philosopher who was a um, student of Ammonius Saccas, you know, and he um, you know, he mm, he treated the central relation between the supreme god and the demiurge uh, and he uh, contrasted the tendency to multiply the divine hypothesis denying the existence of a supreme divine entity above the God that Aristotelically speaking has to be conceived as a pure thinking, right? And then to find the latter as a demiurge, right? As it's believed, as it's conceived by Plato in the Timaeus. Claudianus. Claudianus was a Latin poet of the 4th, 5th century AD. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt. <coughs> he lived in Rome from 395 to 404 up to his death basically so he frequented the imperial court between 400 and 401 he obtained the patrician dignity he was pagan and he had as a, a Greek has his native language he learned Latin through the study of classics he mm, wrote a lot about the greatness of Rome exaltating Stilicho the savior of Italy and Rome from the barbarians, right? He used the examiners and the panegyrics in his invectives, in the historical and mythological poems, in the epithalamy, right? Um, he is um, elegiadistic in the prefactions to the major poems and in the Carmina Minora as well. The Carmina Maiora are uh, among the most important at least the invectives against Rufinus there are two books 296 and Eutropius uh, two books the ministers and Arcadius and the enemies of Stilicho the historical poems the um, De Bello Gildonico 398 and the De Consulato Stiliconis three books written between 399-400 the De Bello Gotico in 647 Examiners on the victory of Stilicho against Alaricus at Polensian 402, the mythological poems, the uh, De Rapto Proserpi, Libri 3, 395, 398, the Gigantomachia in 127 uh, examiners in a half, you know, in an incomplete form. The Carmina Minora, instead, include the Epistole ad Serenum in 404, ad Librium ad Probinum 395 ad Gennadium in 396 and the De Precatio ad Adrianum 396 and among the Greek Carmia we remember the uh, Gigantomachia a discussed attribution to Claudianus a uh, small point in 77 verses and uh, there are other apocryphs um, as well and uh, in Africa it was a very prolific land this time you have of course, since Cyprianus, Arnobius, Lactantius, and Saint Augustine. Cyprianus was uh, Cyprian of, 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 of Carthage, Cecilius Cyprianus, was Tasius, right? He was Bishop of Carthage and father of the church. Uh, he was born in Carthage in 205 and around uh, 205 and died there in 250. He was a rhetor. He was converted when he was 
40 years old to Christianity, he was ordered priest and bishop in 249. And when Dasha's persecution broke out in 250, Cyprian directed the church, was disoriented by um, a refuge, right, um, to, to cart, right, so um, terminated the fury of the persecution, the from the, the result of the problem of the lapse, right, those who were um, desiring to come back in, in to the church, and the rigorism of Novatus and Felicissimus, hence the schism that was contemporary to the one, um, to the Roman one of Novatianus, in which Cyprian maintained a moderate a containment of firmity and comprehension. Council card 251 is witness of this, but um, there was all the consequent problems of the val validity of the bapt baptism conferred to all the schismatics, right? So C Cyprian, uh, you know, supported the necessity of repeating baptism, baptism, contrarily to the doctrine and to the practice of the Roman Church that was embodied at the time by Pope Stephen, according to which the penitence and the imposition of hands were enough, right? And during such, con you know, baptisms baptismal controversy. Cyprian modified his ecclesiastical thought that was variously discussed and interpreted that was firstly favorable to the primacy of um, you know, the effective primacy of Bishop of Rome and that uh, eventually instead was you know transformed into a sort of uh, solely chronological primacy, right? That is to say a sort of genetic one that um, was naturally aimed to affirm the autonomy in the, in the Episcopal sense of the single communities. So the polemic was cut off by the re renewal of the persecution ordered by Valerian, and at the martyrdom of Pope Stephen in August the 2nd, 257, followed the one of Cyprian, that was first exiled, 257, the same month actually, August, and eventually condemned to death. So um, he was executed in Carthage in September 258. So Cyprian's cult, um, you know, crossed soon the boundaries of the African church, and together with the cult had an enormous spread, extraordinary spread, his writings, right, with three, uh, 13 treatises and 65 letters, together to the memoirs written around his life and his martyrdom um, uh, the, there is um, a life of Cyprian written by the Diacon Pontius and also some proconsular acts and leaving the memory of one of the most important characters in the history of the ancient Christian church and his, in his literary activity he mm, you know he was under the influence of Tertullian right in the treatises that are more more or less paratenetical, more than else actually, you know, the usually the, the orat uh, De Orazione Dominica and the Opere et Elemosinis, or, you know, there are also apologetical uh, treatises like the Ad De Demetrianum, right? Um, we remember the Testimonia de Quirinum, for example, his most um, important work for the history of the uh, Latin text of the African, uh, of the Bible in Africa, right, so uh, very important historical documents are his letters, especially the ones directed to the communities and, and to um, to the community and to the bishops of Rome and very debated are the dates and the origins of some other um, texts that are, are, are were not written by him and that are collected in the so-called Appendix Cipriani. Um, Arnobius of Sica, he was a Christian apologist, died around 327. He, he lived in the um, Sica Venerio, this is the today's El Kef, right, in Proconsular Africa. He was a pagan writer, master of Latantius, and he would have converted to Christianity only you know, at a late age, um, and according to Jerome, um, offering um, you know to the bishop to which he you know felt this a proof of his complete changing the seven books adversus nationis that is 
against the uh, the people that is against the pagans, right? They were written before 311. There was the year, the first edict of tolerance by Galerius, right? In the last chapters, of which are you know somewhat, you know, um, scattered and disorderly. In, in, uh, but throughout the whole work, um, he you know quotes the Bible in, in prizes, in, you know, with with much precision, telling the truth. And he also has somewhat superficial theological knowledge, right? And therefore, this sense of, according to to the critic, Ertnobius was still struggling to understand what the world thing was about, really, theologically speaking. And this seems to be reflected also in part with the, by his eschatological worries and pessimism, right? That are actually characteristical elements of African Christianity. Uh, of the time that are, is full of this dramatic uh, changes and you know insecurity was felt and uh, there are interesting uh, also metric matters. Um, speaking of Latantius instead, we already mentioned uh, he was a Christian apologist, lived between the third and fourth century, right, of African origin. Um, he was um, a refined writer, and he he wrote after the Cic Cicero's style. And however, he was a you know moderate thinker. Right after all, he um, he is mostly famous for his attempt to accomplish in in a Latin environment the fusion between the, the classical culture and Christian religion. And among his works, we remember the Divine Instituciones, that are a white uh, apologetical work, um, in which he basically uh, ref ref I mean, c corrects, debunks systematically pagan religion and is accompanied by an exposition of Christian faith that is, you know, somewhat, somewhat simple, right? Somewhat superficial as well. And he was perhaps a scholar of Arnobius, actually. He was teaching a rhetoric, a Latin rhetoric in Nicomedian Bithynia, where he probably converted, and some scholars think he may have <coughs> abandoned Nicomedia during the persecutions, remaining away from it, um, um, from um, 306, right, when he was destituted, or uh, up to 311 or 313. And in 317, he was called by Constantine himself as a preceptor of the son Crispus in Gaul. And his works have been gone lost, probably, um, you know, uh, the, the, were the ones previous uh, to the conversion to Christianity. There are very important philological problems here to, to determine what he wrote, when, what, you know, and so on. He wrote a lot of stuff, seemingly. Um, and um, he, Latensis, somewhat, uh, he has min millenarist elements. Um, there are certain dualistic passages that are strongly also, you know, pra praising Constantine. And uh, some people think that um, th there have been some changes, even of expulsive in his work to, to fix certain aspects of it, right? Um, um, in um, he has this kind of a paradox cut, let's say edge, and um, it, it this poses also other uh, philological problems. Speaking of Augustine, it's even embarrassing to present him like this. But you know, we're talking about uh, Augustine, Aurelius Augustinus, saint, doctor of the church, philosopher, theologian, bishop of Hippo, and saint, right of. Um, he he was Tagastus in the media. Today's Suk Aras in Algeria. In um, born in third on November thirteen three hundred fifty four and died in Hippo. Today's Bona on August the twenty eighth four hundred thirty was one of the great four doctors of the Western Church, the Doctor of Grace, and his work has marked the history of religiosity in European philosophy. Um, he was the son of a decurio Patricius that was still a pagan and of a Christian mother, Monica, that was, um, um, when he was part of the catechesis, uh, you know, and he mm, uh, studied 
in home in Madaurim and actually in Carthage. And this was a period he described he had his uh, love adventures. Uh, he had a son in turn in 72 by a you know, non mayor uh, outside of, of marriage, Adeodatus, right? He, reading the, Orten the Ciceronian Hortensius. He was attracted into philosophy at 19 and he adhered soon to Manichaeism that was presented to him as the scientific explanation of universe and he was a he made a propaganda for it in Tagastus after his father's death and in Carthage he got some success as a writer. He wrote his first book, The Pool Correct Up, that really is now lost, and it, it seemingly he you know made the effort to give a philosophical dress clothed to Manichaeism as such, but uh, he was just listening to it mostly. Then he eventually was, um, uh, he went to Rome, abandoning his mother actually, and here on recommendation of Symmachus, as professor of, of fish, um, official of rhetoric in, in uh, 384 in Milan, where he matured the spiritual crisis, uh, after which uh, he dismissed his uh, concubine and he renounced to a marriage for which this monk insisted he decided to become a Christian and he became at this point um, you know th with the in full agreement let's say between the Neoplatonic philosophy and the preaching of Saint Ambrose right um, the word he got you know this uh, his turn and the Cassiciacum, possibly is um, it's not really, you know, he um, he he got uh, a teaching post. He started writing uh, after also having abandoned it eventually, and he wrote the first dialogues contra academicos, the Vita Beata, and the Ordine and Soliloquia. He began to compose a series of manuals of the liberal arts. He was baptized by Saint Ambrose, the Knight of the, the Holy. Uh, Saturday in, on April 24, 25th, 87. He spent in Rome this, uh, the winter where uh, Monica died in Ostia in November and he came back to Tagastus, continuating his monastic life um, and his writing activity. In 291 he was ordered a uh, priest in Hippo where between the end of 395 and 396, he was consecrated as successor of uh, by the bishop Valerius, who was about to die the same way that he would do in 426 with the priest Heraclius. And his relics were brought in Sardinia by St. Fulgensius and other um, bish um, exi exiled bishops in 486 that were famously eventually brought. Uh, back uh, by King Liutprand uh, in the 8th century where in Pavia where the monument was erected to him um, this is all, all another uh, matter right and he he's all about this polemic aspect in part to the you know the, the conversion the uh, ordination the ordinment and the consecration that uh, scan his life right and he's thought and and his conversion begins with the polemics against the Manichaeans um, and with this other works that are more philosophical religious right the quantitate anime the libero arbitrio the musica the magistro the vera religione the uh, utilitate credendi in which um, Augustine passes gradually from the affirmation of su the essential superiority of reason on the fate to the one utility of, you know, and say a more reasonable approach to it, you know, trusting to the authority founded on revelation and uh, as universally recognized of the church, and to elaborate together with his uh, characteristic doctrine of knowledge, right, and happiness to which men inspire uh, cannot be, con um, you know, achieved without knowing the truth, right? And against the skepticals, he uses his, you know, th this kind of uh, thought that is, if I doubt, I know that I doubt, therefore to be, if I, if I got mistaken, 
uh, I am, right? That is a reason. Um, you know, it's at the base of the same Cartesian way of doubt, right? Uh, but it's it's di it's different context, um, of course. But the truth must be researched within oneself. It's the Neoplatonic doctrine of the coming back on w oneself of the soul that having recognized the you know the instability of the exterior world perceived by the senses and his own uh, it comes to search its um, unchangeable truth for which every reasonment is tr uh, every reasoning is true um, uh, and that God is the same the senses um, therefore and also the words of the masters do, do not just reawaken the ideas that are or in life within our own soul, right? Um, and but um, th this is, however, not in the Platonic sense of the reminiscence, right? But in uh, you know, in um, the sense that there is a truth within man, right? Is in the depth of the soul, right? The master, so it's within man proper. It's not man that looks, you know, forward to to it in a way. So in in depth of soul there is a, an, an inner master, the divine word. Um, in ma within man uh, shines the light of the truth that gives to er each of everybody the eternal reasons, right? The principle and foundation of our judgment. And this theory is the one of called of the uh, of the illumination probe that it's not mm, completely clear. By, by Augustine himself and it's been um, explained in different ways and uh, it's uh, been co connected to the doctrine of the interior master the the, the, the word the, the soul true master that is instead of teaching to the man is just he's just preparing to listen to the voice of the divine word and these doctrines were maintained by Augustine in, uh, even in um, later, this is very extremely important, you know, just for the Protestant Reformation, um, and the word, you know, expressed even later in other works of his, and um, but um, uh, he is, let's say, enthusiasm towards Plato, Plotinus, and the Platonics in general, and the Neoplatonics eventually uh, decreased over time, right? He, the anti manichaean polemics continued is in other writings of his up to the Contra Faustum and other smaller works in 400 um, up to 405 right when he wrote um, another uh, just uh, other I think two works and maybe another work about uh, against the heiresses right and when he became a priest Augustine uh, had to explain naturally the sacred books to the people so he participated more intimately to the life of the church and he comes to know the, the schism that torments the, the African church and that's where he starts his uh, polemics against Donatism um, there are interesting psalms uh, that are very you know popular oriented in this sense up to the great conference of Carthage in 411 then he started writing relatively less um, he wrote the Contra Gaudens in 480 um, that brought him to deal with ecclesiology more closely. He basically followed Cyprian and Tatus, um, you know, rema remaining very firm to the principle of validity and objective efficacy, ex opere operato, of the sacraments, right? The catholicity and the unity of the church, right? Out of which there is no, s no salvation, right? And uh, it's a mixed body, right? He's, that is. You know, it's it's br composed by good and evil people alike, right? And only Christ has the right to separate the two during Judgment Day, so we can't complain about it. Um, but the beginning, um, you know, and still in 441, Augustine didn't want to record to any other mean but the persuasion through discussion. However, with honorous laws against the, the schismatics and in front of their obstinacy, he changed his advice, right? He, um, uh, you know, realized the, you know, he had admitted the legitimacy and the necessity to coercion and the recurrence to civil authority, fixating also the 
the duty for the sover the Christian sovereign to attain to the magister uh, of, the, of the church. And also, uh, especially when he became a priest, Augustine began to study the Bible more intensely, especially the Genesis, uh, passing from the strictly allegorical interpretation to the almost literal one and of global philosophical value, right? And uh, also the letters of St. Paul, right? He commented the various letters. And um, this is a very important moment in the theological thinking of Augustine because it's been very hotly debated. Because he made this effort to maintain, first of all, the justice of God, right? Uh, that r basically pays the rewards the good that is those that by believing acquire a merit and punishes the, the evil but um, after a lengthy effort Augustine comes to recognize that the initial moment of the act of fate right um, it is not human but it comes from God right and this um, it cannot be criticized. There, it, this is not injustice, right? You know, he gratuitously graces some people, while the others, uh, in which the original sin survives, uh, do not deserve but the condemnation. So these concepts appear for the first time with all their clarity in the first writing that is after uh, the Episcopate of Augustine. Um, and it, it's this realization that uh, brings him to to meditate in his life there are brings to the confessions the confessiones one of the greatest works in which he takes also other to consideration other themes that uh, passion him that are that are the ones on the christian culture and the one of the principles that preside to the interpretation of the scripture the first question um, that he dealt with uh, is the is the Christian doctrine proper uh, from a theoretical point of view uh, as much as as in the confessions right he's sensible to the perils of traditional culture the pagan one but he wants to save the good of it so um, there is something that must be taken by Christianity from it so he brings to an end this long controversy through which, uh, through which his own authority, Augustine, um, uh, renders legitimate the transmission of uh, ancient culture, right, into the Christian one. Um, there are other problems rela rel um, relating to, for example, the problem of creation, right? He feels very much the chronological dimension, right? He thinks the creation came from throughout time, rather with time from 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 nothing let's say and for all the things simultaneously but not in, in the same exact way right? some things are being created by god not um in in uh, in action in their perfect form but just in power right what augustine calls rationis seminalis so it's just the seed of it some latent energies that are destined to develop over time to produce at uh, the right moment for each different beings um, and uh, he was brought to this by the study of the Genesis, and um, he he wrote lots actually of other uh, works in the meanwhile in these years. Uh, he wrote also cate catechetic uh, education, right? For uh, with the comment to the Genesis that remained a bit at the, the center of his attention. And also another smaller work around 400, the Catechizandis Rutipus, right? It's a very practically oriented thing as well. Um, it's the, the the motive of memory that appears in the Confessiones that is becomes very important, and about which he will write the very famous treaty, the Trinitate, right? Uh, that took 16 years to write, and um, according to Augustine, the soul is a thought, is a mens from which uh, is a uh, conscience and notizia as, as he calls it in Latin is born right and in the relating to this knowledge love is born right you know um, the love that same mind 
brings. So the soul, or better the memory, in the intellect, in the will, in the higher, no more, more no noble part, of, noble part of it, right? You know, um, that remembers, that comprehends and loves it itself, right? But especially remembers, knows, and loves God, right? And that's where where Augustine sees the relics of the same divine trinity, right? He poses this emphasis on the substance and in insisting on the equality of the three persons. What is it attributed in terms of wisdom, of intelligence? And uh, it, it, it's identical. We are all the three persons have it, but um, in, in different uh, relations to each other. Right? The theory is that clearing the procession of the Holy Ghost uh, principally from the Father but also from the God becomes particularly important for the development of the Western theology uh, to which Augustine tied this Christ-centric character right, that is conformed to the tendency, the fundamental tendency of his thought that revolves around the person and the work of Christ and the redemption of man from sin right, through uh, through good grace and around this uh, topics also would uh, start uh, Pelag Pelagius uh, controversy right that um, you know we have actually discussed things somewhere else but uh, we you know, we don't repeat uh, that brought to actually serious problems um, that brought ev even to, to Pelagius condemnation eventually um, there are different many other works now talking about Augustine is, is pretty long um, but let's say the Augustinian doctrine of the original scene from grace predestination is um, uh, it, it's been hotly debated because it went strengthening over time right he Augustine took his idea from the condition of Adam right it was created e exempt from debt and from desire that for he was capable n of not sinning right in the fur in a full liberty to opt for good by conforming to a reason that had the perfect mm, control of himself and the senses uh, capable of persevering in good thanks to the help granted to him by God so when Adam sinned his sin uh, his fault was transmitted to the entire of course, human genus becoming uh, this damned mass, right? And uh, and the baptism um, eliminates, according to him, the the greed in this sense, even to the children, right? Um, this is a, a uh, debated element, right? Um, you know, or better, he, it 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 um, it eliminates the 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 greed. As a, as a crime, but he lets live it in 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 act, so that the man, albeit maintaining his free will, he's deprived of that full freedom that he had enjoyed in the paradise as Adam, right? So, in order to resist to the attraction to the sin, therefore uh, occurs a greater help than the one Adam first received. Uh, so, differently from him, the uh, the condition of mankind after uh, the the, inc the incarnation um, is um, is is grace, right? It, that is necessary in order to have faith, because that comes from the love of God as sublime good, without which there could be no happiness nor true morality, right? Uh, but this help is not connected to everybody, right? God, without any justice, but just for mercy prepares uh, for some the means that are fully efficacious to bring them to, to salvation right to which he has predestined them uh, there are a lot of problems here uh, still relatively to Pelagianism and the accusations of Manichaeism that were brought against Augustine um, and there also the, the, the enormous problem that would bring him to write the uh, the Civitate Dei, right? That uh, came from this moral shock of the sack of Alaric in Rome, um, and uh, in which he restates, like you know, this idea of the predestined, right, uh, groups, um, those who are damned, those who are saved. We must cut it in 
conclude it another time because otherwise we, we don't come out of here alive. Um, and we can discuss, however, I'm sorry to cut it like that, but I, I realize maybe it's really too much for today, so I'm trying to make it speedier because there are a lot of important things to stress. But, um, you know, just to finish to mention that there's Spain, Spain, there is Orosius and Prudentius Orosius was I uh, was born in Braga, Braga, today's Prague in Portugal, between the fourth and fifth century. He was in Palestine, um, Palestine, a uh, disciple of Saint Jerome, right? He participated in the Council of Jerusalem four hundred fifteen. Uh, he also fought against Pelagianism. His major work is the famous Historiarum ad versus Paganus Libri Septem. It was started like by like crazy by especially late antiquity in the early Middle Ages, um, even adapted by Alfred the Great, translated in Arab. Right, the Middle Ages was particularly famous and important. We know very few about his life, though. Right, we know he was called Paul, just because Jordanus, uh, you know, mentions him as such once, and uh, we know mostly only about the years 414, 480. Right, he was. He was already a priest by the time, uh, as an adult, he reached Africa and sent August in order to offer him his first work. Um, there was the Commonitorium uh, de Errore Priscillianistarum uh, et Origenistarum, so these are against the Priscillians and the Originists, and also to ask the St. Augustine some things about you know, solving many doubts of his fate. To which the saint answered with his adorosium, right? Contra Priscillianistas et Origenistas. He went in Palestine for 1415 also to enrich his theological education next to St. Jerome. Then eventually reached Jerusalem at the bitterest moment of the anti Pelagian clash. He uh, participated in the Council of Jerusalem, but he was accused in turn of Pelagianism by the, the bishop of that city, John II, to which he responded with the Liber Apologeticus contra Pelagianus. He came back in, from Palestine home and uh, he he knew of great disorders in Spain at the time, so he came back to St. Augustine that was writing De Civitate Dei at the time. And he was brought by him to write the Historiarum uh, that we were mentioning before, the uh, the, the seven books of the histories against uh, the, the pagans, his major work that took him two years, right? And this he wrote, uh, he actually took inspiration from the third book of the Civitate Dei, for which the, the evil are, have always been present in the history and cannot be imputed to Christianity. Um, and uh, he also writes this compilation of so many older historical, you know, uh, um, Old, it's a pagan and Christian uh, historians, actually. It's Lustus, Suetonius, Justin, um, an epitome of Titus Livy, uh, Florus, Eutropius, Eusebius of Caesarea. He, he basically makes the history of humanity, highlighting how the, the evil have always um, afflicted it, right? And um, he obviously shows a clear providential plan in it that, of course, has pre ordered also the creation of, of the Roman land, right, he's the first one that uses the term Romania, actually, would become the, the, the land of the Romans, as such, and and even the providence of the same barbarian invasions, so this is very important, as you understand, for the sake of uh, the, the general acceptation of, of the new changes, and um, he has a, you know, this very limpid prose that, um, I mean, especially in the, of course, in the theory, of history that was very easily accepted in the Middle Ages, and uh, this is very important. Dante quotes him in the Paradise. He was, you know, fairly limpidly interpreted, and um, as uh, you know, definitely a, a supporter of the Christian cause in a in an historiographical perspective in the, in the history of times. Then, as we have said, Prudentius. Red Aurelius Prudentius Clemens was a uh, Christian Latin poet. He was born in Spain, uh, either in Calahorra or Saragossa in 348, and he's been defined as the major, um, uh, exp you know, uh, hum Christian humanist of the fourth century. Right, he's uh, very educated, 
poet, right? His uh, his work is rich in classical references. He has a great metrical wide, uh, you know, uh, expertise in this sense. But he's also able to use popular tones to to be moving and to be Christianly simple. Uh, Prudentius um, doesn't want to substitute the ancient pagan culture, but to embrace it to the new Christian conscience we know um, about him just what basically he says of himself in the uh, preface to his poetry. We we even know we don't even know much about when he died, probably after 405. He was from a noble family of Spain. He came to Rome where he first exercised rhetoric and uh, he and law. He was a lawyer. Then he uh, undertook the civil career and became to elevated uh, offices at the court of Theodosius that protected him. And at 57 years old, he renounced to the mundane honors to dedicate to poetry and religious life. His poetry corpus comprehends uh, um, the titles that are almost all in Greek that, uh, of course, make us think that uh, he knew this, this language pretty well. Um, there is the Catemerinon, the Peristephanon, and um, 14 hymns in honor of the martyrs, especially Roman and Spanish ones, the Anapotheosis, um, the Banking of Heresies, the Hamas, the Genia, on the Origins of Evil. Uh, there is, um, uh, you know, a, a work against the Marcionism, the dualism, and uh, two books against Symmachus, in which he uh, fights the surviving Roman paganism, the Dittokion, the double nourishment, and with the allusion to the Old and New Testament, in which uh, he illustrates many episodes, the Psychomachia, uh, on the clash between vices and, and virtues, um, and in the, in the Christian soul. Right? Uh, this came to be very, uh, you know, famous uh, as a work in the Middle Ages because, uh, you know, naturally it brought also to the victory, of course, of, of the virtue over evil. As we were saying before, uh, he is, um, you know, Prudentius is very educated. He's he's proud of that, of his knowledge of, of Greek, but um, he remains always within the uh, boundaries of classical tradition. He uses the oration in Catullian metrics, for example, especially in the preface to the poems, he imitates continuously Virgil and other poets. He has some rhetorical developments and uh, kind of endless uh, explanations. He he wants to instruct. He's he's um, therefore uh, uh, far away from the simplicity of those hymn hymn writers and um, and this explains also why a few of what he wrote actually entered in the liturgy of the church, because it was not of direct com immediate communicability, let's say, to, to the masses. But his theological ideas are actually very good, you know, especially in finding heresies. He was nourished with classical culture, so he felt deeply this need to celebrate the victory of Christianity over paganism in the language and in the metrical forms of the Latins. So. Um, he he was also for the rest he was not fairly particularly original he follows um, Ambrose and Saint Tertullian um, but he is um, inspired by uh, you know profound and sin sincere faith right he he has a, a beautiful style and he was rightfully admired as we've seen in the Middle Ages and also among the moderns as uh, the greatest actually of the uh, Christian Latin poets, right? Th these figures are very important. I know it's it's count sound of, mm, sounds kind of boring if you're not interested specifically in in, in their lives, etc. But they they had a great impact, much greater impact than it seems in the history of especially of medieval literature in the West. And and a bit aside from these, there are, uh, but still extremely important for their theological message St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, and the Dalmatian St. Jerome. There are uh, definitely examples as well of the so-called Fathers of the Church. Um, 
Ambrose of Milan, even in here we can't make uh, an entire history of him, um, we will talk about him on another occasion, but uh, you know, w w what we are talking about, doctor of the church, um, you know, he was born in 3 or 333 or 340, died in Milan in 397, um, he lost his father, um, so that had been actually prefect of the Praetorium, and uh, he went to Rome with the mother was the with the sister Marcelina it was eventually a nun in 354 and the brother Satyrus three hundred seventy eight. He was protected by Sextus Praetorius Probus was Praetorian prefect and became three hundred seventy um consularis of um <coughs> the Aemilia and Liguria with the residence in Milan and when the bishop o census there was an Arian died uh, Ambrose was still a catechumen and he was proclaimed bishop in a few days he received the baptism and consecration in 374. Uh, he began this the theological preparation, began certain exegetical works uh, praising virginity. He uh, he became very influent actually. He he persuaded the emperor creation to re entertain to recollect the anti pagan Legislation to order in 382 the removal of the statue of victories seen before from the Senate, Senate's uh, Curia. Uh, he, this brought a great um, um, controversy between Ambrose and Symmachus. In that, on that occasion, Ambrose um, uh, also uh, kind of re reminded Valentinian II that had succeeded to Gratian his uh, you know, duties as a Christian emperor. Um, in that uh, he f thought that he had to be within the church, uh, not over it. So Valentinian and his mother uh, Justina had um, uh, him were very grateful for to him for the mission that he, uh, Ambrose made uh, to the usurper Maximus that uh, at the moment refrained from attacking Italy. In well, second mission failed. And that's a point. At this point, he was writing the the Theta for creation in in the um, in the previous years in in the Council of um, of Aquileia in 381, where Augustine had become defender of the Orthodoxy against the Arians as well. And these were favored by uh, Justina, that um, actually asked uh, ordered Ambrose to built them a church, he resisted and the conflict became harsher and uh, he uh, it was a, a, a erratic bishop was sent to Milan to, to overthrow him and he, there was actually a violent um, following in the, uh, in, the, in the community, he revived his faith through uh, a liturgical chant that was taught and sustaining uh, the siege during this this clash, well, uh, up to the point at which the court had to give up, and after, uh, a few time afterwards, in Easter 387, as we have seen, he baptized Augustine, and he was he showed the same firmness towards Theodosius that uh, had uh, ordained him the reconstruction at episcopal expenses of the synagogue of Callinicus that had been destroyed by the Christians, and especially in, during the repression of a of a rebellion that had been ordered by Theodosius in Thessalonica in 309. It, aside from the legions that uh, gravitate around the, the events, are very meaningful in the application of the uh, principles that were expressing for this to say the emperor that would, would be very strong in the middle ages for which the emperor had to be within the church not above it basically and he was one of the greatest figures of course um, among Christian bishops in fourth century um, he he was inspired by especially by the great Cap uh, Cappadocian fathers that we've seen before but he also produced original content in terms of uh, especially ecclesiastical governments um, against the erratics, the dissidents, and um, as defender of the Roman primacy, by the way, he collected or found uh, stored relics. Um, he was an authoritative guide of northern Italy. He was a moralist. Uh, and he exalted chastity 
charity and uh, justice. He regularized liturgy, also in the chant he composed his hymns um, that are in fact one of uh, part of his literary fames and uh, he was also a great orator, a great speaker and uh, of the exegetic treatises he he, um, he used um, first of all the, f the most famous is the examiner right on the six days of creation he, he used a lot of allegories in there um, the among the moral uh, ones uh, there is also the officious ministrorum that is um, you know written over the the officious the officious of cicero and it's the first attempt of synthesis of Christian ethics, importantly enough. Um, very important are his uh, letters, right, as historical de uh, documents as well. There is all an iconography also that developed um, around him. That's very important. For what concerns uh, Jerome, right, Hieronymus, so doctor of the Latin Church, he was born uh, close to Aquileia in uh, 347. He died in Bethlehem in 1419. He came from a well-off Christian family. Um, he uh, came to Rome and was, was very young, together with the friend Bonosus, to, to study actually very at very high levels of uh, grammar and rhetorics. And here he, um, he also attended classes very influent masters and he uh, became definitely inclined to, for philology letters uh, with an attitude and passion that characterize also his asceticism asceticism it made of him uh, perhaps the greatest symbol of Christian humanism in many ways but Bonosus, at the end of the studies in Rome he passed in Gaul in Trier where he spent his uh, you know some years and he studied and wrote uh, important works we found him in Aquileia in this uh, you know very educated circle uh, gathered around the Bishop Valerian and frequented by his friend Rufinus but um, uh, eventually he left in 373 together with Bonosus and other friends towards the east in 374 he was in Antioch when um, Evagoras uh, welcomed him and assisted him during a long illness, by the way. And in this year's in Calchas, he, um, he really had his, his intellectual, uh, you know, illuminate, enlightenment, we could say. Um, his, um, he refused, basically, uh, completely pagan literature. He, you know, he dedicated, started to dedicate deliberately, exclusively to the Bible. Right, you know, he he refused any other influence at that point, and um, th this was allegedly because of a uh, of a dream, in which Christ had uh, basically told him, reproached him of being a Ciceronian, not a Christian. So he left Antioch and he retired in the desert, where he uh, de started to to study, dedicating himself to 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 Hebrew and uh, biblical exegesis. Um, he um, came out of his isolation just because during the, the clash between Paulinus and Manasius that we were recalling before and during the so-called Antiochian schism where uh, he was uh, persuaded by Evagoras to take the, part, uh, the side of the, 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 the first that ordered him as a priest but also he fought against the, the, uh, the Luciferian extremism in 379 um, in the year after, however, he left Antioch to go to Constantinople to follow the lessons of Greg Gregory in, uh, of Nazianzus that we observed before, and to perfect the study of Greek. And in 282, together with Paulinus and Epiphanius of Salamis, Jerome uh, came to Rome. He participated to the council indicted by Pope Damasus to resolve the Antiochian schism. He was very appreciated by the literate pope, and uh, he was entrusted to basically revise all the uh, the, the Greek texts of the ancient. Um, I mean, uh, to revise the, the the Latin version of the Bible on the base of the the older Greek uh, on, on, on the Greek texts proper, and of course also his um, his um, 
broader linguistical knowledge we have seen he had matured in, in the East. So uh, this work is the Psalterium Roman, right? Um, and um, not only the biblical studies uh, kept him busy on the Aventine in the house of Marcella, but he gathered together um, around uh, many other uh, matrone, right? That um, he became was he became the the ascetical guide and spiritual master. Uh, and um, this, however, he insisted on asceticism so much that he isolated himself uh, ever more from uh, you know, the, especially his group of former friends, while the personal enemies became more threatening to him. At the death of Damasus in 384, uh, J uh, Jerome prefers to to ban Rome and to come back to a uh, solitude basically he he came to 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 Antioch uh, together with uh, with other supporters eventually in Bethlehem where he uh, directs a, a male monastery right while he remains in contact with other female friends and uh, for uh, more than 30 years Jerome makes this enormous work of translation, exegesis, and um, you know, kind of polemical terms also against the the heresies and so on. He becomes an enormous amount of biblical commentaries, uh, very long to, to list, to basically altered both the Old and uh, New Testament, and he uh, his exegesis actually proceeds from the uh, Origenian. Um, um, allegorism, right? But he makes a more ardent lateral exam. So and th there is also the possibility of seeing how his thought evolved over time, right? Um, and um, the, the throughout all his life, at least. And this work um, also took some pauses and so on. But um, let's say that he uh, reaffirmed the superiority of abstinence and virginity. Uh, he had uh, a, a brief dis mm, epistolar dispute with Augustine. Um, there is also the clash with R Rufinus in the meanwhile. Um, and uh, th there was a also an accusation of uh, originism right, that had presented by the latter to him that he refuted completely. And uh, he quarreled, let's say, with other figures and that I which generally dominated the worry to avoid in the ascetical practice um, you know uh, let's say other temptations that he 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 doesn't want to justify theologically speak so uh, it's very important f especially for christian literature the the very illustribus that on the examples of Suetonius on the Christian writers. There is well, also his real operation of the Chronicle of Eusebius that was very important for the medieval culture, the first humanism. And it's uh, a remarkable f f source of information, especially what concerns the chronology of Latin literature. He was a great writer, he was very cultured. Jerome owes his fame mostly to his letters, 150. Um, and also, even perhaps even more than for his translation of the Bible, right? That was possibly the most thing he's famous for, as we've seen the Pope had commissioned to him. Um, and um, there was um, there was this, this broader, you know, uh, tension that we've seen since the beginning between his, you know, pagan culture past, you know, between Christ and Caesar. It was seen. Uh, very pro, very, you know, was recontextualized in the humanism that was retaking in a Christian context the, uh, the the pagan authors and was posing this problem. So he was eventually reread in these terms, right? Um, in this period, late antiquity, very important are actually also the two other important traditions that we should discuss at some point that are the Judaic. Um, one, um, especially the Babylonian Talmud at one of Jerusalem, and also the Syrian and Armenian ones, as well as you, you know the late uh, literature of properly Byzantine times, even from the sixth century, chiefly the uh, 
um, the Talmud, you know, of course, the the, the, the studying, the teaching, the, the discipline, there are these two wide works, the Babylon A's Talmud and the Palestinian A's Talmud, right, that represent each one the corpus of traditional doctrine, particularly from a juridical point of view of Hebraism. And um, that came to be constituted because of this Amorian um, doctors of Babylon and Palestine between the 3rd and the 5th century. Right, and we when we talk of the Talmud, we often think of the Babylonian one, that is the one that had more spread and more authority, right? And also about this uh, Jewish traditions, we should study way more because they are dramatically fascinating. But now I also want to conclude the video because it's dramatically long. Um, what I wanted to shift the attention to was this mass of information that is present in the juridical collections, the Theodosian Code. Right, it was compiled between 429 and 438 on the disposition of Theodosius II that makes us knowing that, that this um, part of the imperial legislation is promulgated since the time of Constantine. Right? Um, and it's the first attempt of official codification of the sources of right and at the same time the, the most conspicuous collection of constitutions that came out of the Justinian hand, compilation that is actually, you know, just also built on it at the same time. The first project actually contemplated, besides the collection uh, at with a scientific or didactic aim, also of, of all the constitutions, the so-called leges generales from that were issued by the emperors from Constantine onwards, a practical work um, of the the in enforced law existing at the time that could comprehend the ledges and the jura as well, so the properly the system, but the the work was limited to a collection of constitutions, right, of practical, right, uh, character, right, and uh, it was mm, welcomed and published in, in the West eventually in, by Emperor Valentinian III. Later, of course, more famous is the Corpus Juris Civilis of Justinian that has, uh, left especially in the digestum of the 533, a collection of extracts, and here we find, uh, you know, the text of jurists that constituted an authority in jurisprudence that had li lived since the second century BC to the fourth century AD, in particular Gaius and the Severian jurists, Paulus, Papinianus, Callistratus, and especially Ulpianus. Right, and when we talk about the the codex, right, of 534, we are talking about the decisions, um, the imperial decisions that we find even here from the time of Hadrian. So they had been extended even uh, beyond Constantine in that regard. Um, uh, famously, the Codex Justinianus was co collected twelve books. Right, it was compiled on behalf of, of Justinian. Um, by ten jurists, uh, including Tribonianus and Theophilus, and published in 529. So, in the important aspect of this and the Perpetua Sancta is the um, legislative unification of the empire. Right? Even in here, we should make an enormous digression in terms of what this was aimed for, like uh, aimed at, like or what um, the, um, the the worries were. In this regard, and uh, you know what were the even practical um, accomplishments, because it wasn't so easy, right? We are studying it in the medieval law playlist, where it's all more evident. But uh, there were regions of the empire that knew this legislation probably just for a few years, then they had to cope with other systems. So it's actually fairly complicated overall. But uh, we'll see it, in fact, mostly medieval history later. Very important to stress um, is also this other, you know, tendency to make an inventory. Like the, during late antiquity, there's this idea that there had been this past now that weight that had produced a lot, and from which many interesting uh, information could be recollected, right? And uh, to make an inventory of the statu quo. Right, and among these consequences, there was the notitia dignitatum, about which we made a video for what concerns all the the, the emblems of the various military units that appear in it. Uh, it's the Roman um, army playlist. 
it's um, catalog of the administration of military forces of the empire, right across the fourth fifth century. Uh, it was retouched over time, but uh, it's very important. The, the official name is Notitia Dignitatum et Administrationum Omnium Tam Civilium Quan Militarium, because at this point the two things were actually split, but uh, they were taken in consideration as such, in fact, so there was a, there had to be a specific correspondence to all of the, the various districts and, uh, and armed forces. Um, uh, or and um, they were connected, let's say, I mean, in forms of in administrative forms. And um, um, there are oh, these sections actually for the, the eastern and the western Roman part, the competences and the titles of the single functionaries and the name of uh, deployment to the various military corpses. And um, this is a fundamental source for the knowledge of the administration of the low empire. It's a must, should be read and uh, understood. Clearly, um, spend another word on the so-called auxiliary sciences. Disregard, right? Because the the, the picture of the sources doesn't doesn't stop here at all, right? The um, let's say scholarly researches and the one of the archaeologists have given rise to different disciplines that the, the scholars define as auxiliary sciences, right? Uh, this expression is rightfully criticized because. Um, they are disciplines on their own, and to precise the knowledge given by the authors, in other times they they make us discover fields that have been ignored. Now they're well established, like epigraphy, for example. It's the studying of um, written uh, of texts written on hard material like uh, stone, bronze, uh, wood, or terracotta. And it's not poorer for the fourth century than previous centuries. Like there's no idea of this broader decline at all, right? In on the contrary, it left a dramatically long inscription sometimes, that are also usually realized with a f floral, you know, style. It's very, you know, aesthetical. But it also refers to different um, needs and public needs that were becoming increasingly private in some ways especially in certain areas of the empire, but that r show exactly that kind of uh, the still decentralized, autonomous, um, you know, character that after all the empire uh, had. Um, and um, the latter works were to be written a bit like the Perpetua Sanctio of Law, right? In this, uh, with this um, presumption of, of eternity, right? Uh, this I the spirit that uh, had the word commissioned by privates, right? We're talking even of funerary or, or honorific inscriptions usually, um, and um, uh, there is naturally a bit of uh, idealism in what is written. Uh, you know, all the the you know the, the, you know husbands and wives are always great people. You know, the, 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 you know all these families are so. Uh, extremely noble and, and, and pure and brave and all this stuff but actually uh, there is also a um, th there is way more to know from this aptitude than from from the actual content in this sense you know for what it was being presented it's the same thing um, and the official context especially uh, are very important to understand in this critical sense because for example, for a juridical point of view, you know, when th there are there were certain messages, epigraphically uh, speaking, that were presented in f uh, for um, for the public. I think, for example, on the edict of the higher prices at the Bregentius table, the um, uh, um, rescript of the Hispellum, the album of Timgad, right? There's plenty of stuff. There's another very important field that is popularology, especially for what concerns the East and uh, Eastern provinces, and especially Egypt, sometimes also Syria, due to Europa, because these are, you know, drier areas, um, and therefore the papyrus can't, could survive more than, than in the West. And naturally, the papyrus was meant to be used more, um, you know, uh, more frequently, um, you know, more, um, let's say, commonly. For for information that is of smaller 
uh, if you want importance but still dramatically precious because we in fact usually we don't have that information so it acquires more value uh, for example everyday life the prices mu municipal institutions the local level religion right very interesting is also um, in um, many ways numismatics what is the studying of, of currency of money and um, there, there were, it was extremely abundant, especially in the 14th century. It, it allows to follow this economical conjuncture, putting to evidence this um, double evolution of the weight and the content of the metal. Right? And numismatics naturally make us know also imperial ideology, right? rather than the propaganda, because it is not sure that actually those who use the money, of course, had ever even cared about the texts or the people that were, uh, you know, cast, uh, you know, impressed on, on, on the surface. So it was just an instrument of exchange in really places that were outside of the empire. So that's also very fascinating. Um, um, this, this helps us also to draw a geographical map of the empire of the trade. Uh, because naturally, wherever we find this this money, that we can understand that uh, it's as far as the, those coins traveled, right? And uh, sometimes as much as the Romans traveled, for that matter. So this is particularly interesting, um, and uh, this geographical map can also reveal, given the archaeological finds, the distribution of um, monetary treasures that were buried. Right. Um, for example, this tracks somewhat fascinatingly the the the, the routes of the invasions because the people, this is typical late antiquity, they you know this along the borders, the more subjected to uh, foreign invasion, they they buried their their goods, and they um, they essentially uh, thought that they could at that point uh, find you know to, to come back when the invasion was over instead they would remain buried this is typical of the time of many other um, many other contexts not just the, the Roman one actually um, also it's impossible to present archaeology as such but it's ever more difficult in the measure in which the mass of the documents is uh, is overwhelming and also constantly evolving in many ways there is a unique word that designs effectively very different disciplines you know for the, the, the enormous amount of objects that can't be just the minimal right or for stuff you know uh, the fibula, for example, or to think about the villa or the city, right? Think about ceramics, every type of monument. You could think of statues. Think about one of the tetrarchs that today is in Venice, of the monuments like the Arc of Thessalonica, of uh, of houses proper, the, like the one of Piazza Armerina, or the one of Montmorin, or the palaces of Split, the churches of Saint Clemente or Saint Martino ai Monti in Rome, or so most beautiful um, important churches um, of the time military forts the one of Luxor the forts of Syria right on the eastern frontier Th those are very very important also for the early Byzantine times 6th century are astonishingly beautiful structures and they can't tell us so much and we can't there is, I, I presume there is no homogeneity even in archaeology in this sense I mean you know as an archaeologist you can be very different people um, yeah, just like, it possibly even more than just like an historian, so because you work also with various degrees, with just the you know the archaeological find and the maybe the written document. Naturally, it's all mixed. So, I think this can this video can tell us, generally speaking, what the the, the sources are about which are the most important works, the most important figures, with which environments they they lived in. Right, um, and it's obvious that th th it's very complicated. By the third and fourth century, if, if you want to recreate that reality, you have to to use all the documents that you find, right, to preliminarily observe what the critics has already said about that, what you can expect from it, what you can't expect from it, 
it's relatively easier than in other moments, historically speaking, but um, it's still very challenging in many ways. The principal difficulty resides exactly in here. It presents two aspects. Many documents that are um, really not very well known, right? There is a lot of space even for, for historiography, philology. Don't think that we have studied so much like everything about. Of course, mm, this really happens in practice in relative terms that, of course, everybody has looked first before you did all these sources easily and overwhelmingly, but still they're not overwhelmingly connected, I think, or if, even if it happens, there's still room for, for discovering a lot, and especially archaeologically speaking, right? Um, uh, many contents have also not been worked, scientifically speaking, if you look at the, the Roman armament, Right, you know, it's just from fairly modern times we're realizing what th th this this world deal actually was. Right, you know what, how diversified and non-standardized the Roman equipment was throughout all its history. For example, most people still believe in the thing, and we have built a perception of uh, of that that is completely rigged um, in many ways. So it, it's it's very wide, really. What you can't draw a lot of researches to do still. Still not as much as in other fields, but equally um, importantly for what this history represents, because we have just that sometimes. So uh, uh, that's that that's representative for a, a many times and places more than, than other information. All right, excruciatingly long video. Sorry for that. Maybe we should cut on <laughs> should have cut on all the various biological uh, biographical. Excuse me. Uh, information relatively to the, the various authors, but I think that was important just to give a background even of the figures, right? I'm, I'm sorry I skipped on St. Augustine, but it was a, it was, would be too long as to listen.